Thanks on that. Uh, we'll move now to the next item of business, which is uh, a pre-stage two debate on the UK withdrawal from the European Union legal... Oh, point of order, Joanne Lamond. I'm seeking... I'm seeking... I've got more than one presiding officer in the room, obviously. Um, I'm seeking your clarification on the purpose and the conduct of the, this afternoon's session. You will know that I have expressed some concern about the level of scrutiny of this legislation. And if we recall in the debate, it was confirmed that we would, in fact, one session would go in front of the Finance Committee. And I want to commend all staff who have turned round masses of material in such a short time. We all recognise the challenges of that for committees too. However, and I understand that the committee will go through the amendments um, amendment by amendment, group by group, as is the normal process. What I want to clarify is the purpose of this session. My understanding was we would, in this session, go through amendments, group by group, in the same way, expressing a view on those amendments in order to inform the work of the Finance Committee. I would be concerned, first of all, we do not appear to have purpose and effect notes, which I think um, there was an indication that we would receive these, and I may have misunderstood that. But I would wish the side officer to confirm that the debate will concentrate on the amendments that have been lodged rather than a rerun of a debate on the general principles of this legislation, which we have already debated in some detail. So I would seek the clarification from the presiding officer that it is the intention that we focus on the amendments as lodged, that we clarify their purpose and effect, and we inform the thinking of the Finance Committee when they go into the full stage two. Can I thank uh, Joanne Lamond for the points she raises? Uh, I'll just make a number of points by way of reply. This issue was discussed at length uh, by business managers, including our own business manager at the Parliamentary Bureau last week. And the very points that Joanne Lamond raises were discussed. Uh, and so I would, I would urge members in, in all these situations to have a long chat with their own business manager just to find out what the thinking was. In this case, just to share it with all members, uh, and first of all, could I, before I say that, can I also uh, thank uh, Joanne Lambert for uh, her accommodation to the staff. I, I'm also aware that our clerking staff have worked long hours to turn this around in time uh, and have been working very hard on this bill. We had a big discussion about whether or not to have this and to, to discuss the amendments in a group-by-group group, uh, way, as you would do if you're pursuing amendments in committee, or whether to, to view them in the round. And we decided that if we were to take them group-by-group, would essentially be uh, second-guessing the work of the Finance Committee uh, or, or rehearsing their business. And I don't think that's the purpose of this debate. The idea is that this debate is informed by the publication of the amendments. So all the members, we're having this debate now, that all the amendments have been published, all the members have had access to those amendments and uh, can uh, therefore contribute to this debate uh, in the light of that and choose the subjects and the issues they wish to raise uh, in the light of that. Um, purpose and effect notes, as the member will also know, um, are entirely um, at the discretion of members or the government. It, it has become quite a, a habit of late for the government to produce purpose and effect notes, but the member will also know that has not always been the case and it is entirely still at the discretion of uh, minister or members. The member wishes to make a, a second point. Joanne Lamont, sorry, calling Joanne Lamont. Regardless Lamont. of whether members have an individual conversation with business managers, I'm not party to how that then balances out within the Bureau. There's a fundamental issue, which is the purpose of this session was to inform the thinking of those in the Finance Committee of the Parliament as a whole on the amendments. If we have a generalised discussion, they don't get that information. If we don't have purpose and effect, it's actually quite difficult for us to direct our comments on individual amendments. And I think that is, um, that is a challenge for everyone. Can I at least ask the presiding officer rules out of order someone who simply speaks to the general principles again on this legislation and does not address their comments to individual amendments? I'm sorry, but I, I will not rule out any member who wishes to speak on, on, on the general principles. The, the point is all members' contributions will now be informed by the publication of the amendments and they can choose which amendments to speak to or not or to talk to the, the, the general points raised by those. We discussed this issue at length, weighing up the very points that Joanne Lambert has brought to our attention, and it is a difficult balance. It's a choice. We decided to give members the choice of which points they wish to raise and have the advantage of having more members speak, which I note is what uh, all the parties have gone for. Uh, however, I do welcome uh, the points that uh, uh, the member raises and allows 
other members to uh, be aware of the discussion we had. So on that, and given that we're very pressed for time, um, I would also remind members that we're actually applying a new debate management approach to this debate. We're, uh, yes, the members are looking surprised. Normally, uh, time is allocated absolutely uh, even-handedly across the board. In this particular debate, we've given parties more discretion to allocate time to some members uh, to the level that they wish to. So what we'll find in this debate is that some members have four minutes, some five, some seven, some ten. And that has been agreed. It's the first time we're trying this procedure. But just in case you think that some members are getting more time than you are, this has been discussed with the, with the business managers in advance, and it's, it's a novel procedure. Uh, exactly. We're hoping it makes for a more discursive, less confrontational debate, Mr Swinney. Uh, and on that note, can I call as our opening speaker, Michael Russell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And as ever, I am in positive and non-confrontational mode. Um, and I hope that, that, I hope that will last throughout the entire debate. And no one will be happier than me, considering the length of day that we are looking at at the moment. Last week, this parliament, I'm glad I'm being counted down by, uh, by uh, Mr. Finlay. I, I now have a challenge to meet here that I'm going to remain non-confrontational despite that. Last week, this Parliament agreed overwhelmingly to the general principles of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill, which I'm going to refer to as a continuity bill from now on. And today we turn to detailed scrutiny, and clearly this is an innovation, this debate, and I'm glad the Bureau has discussed it at such length. We will have this priestess to debate to allow all members a chance to comment to the bill and the amendments tabled, and I'm sure that they will do so. Uh, there are 261 or 262, depending how you define these amendments, to be considered at this time. Later this evening, late, uh, of course, yes. Mike Rumbles. One particular amendment, which is my colleague Tavish Scott's amendment number 34 about section 13. I want to vote for this bill. However, I consider the powers that section 13 gives, the extremely extreme powers given to ministers by section 13 not to be justified and on that basis would the minister consider accepting Tavish Scott's amendment number 34? Well, I have considered accepting every amendment some have not detained me very long some have detained me a longer period of time I can confirm to the member it will be my intention to accept amendments in that section and it is my intention to do everything I possibly can to get the member to vote for this bill uh, and I will endeavour to do so, because I know the member seriously objections to this section in the bill. I want him to vote for this bill, so I will endeavour to do everything I can to make sure this bill is acceptable to him, as well as to the wider ch chamber, and part of that will be to consider seriously and to bring forward views on the amendments from Tavish Scott. Of course. Neil Finlay. I wonder if the Minister would just um, clear, clear things up right away by just saying that he'll remove that section of the bill. No, I, I know that that is what the member wants me to do, but I am not prepared to remove this section. But I am prepared uh, at this stage to consider very radical changes to this section that will limit what can be done with this section. But I gave some examples this morning, presiding officer, uh, to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee of why I felt this section would be important. And I'm happy to, to expand upon those uh, this evening uh, when we uh, debate the amendments. Later this evening, we have the stage two in the Finance and Constitution Committee, which will consider the amendments formally. Now, I am going to comment in detail on some of the uh, issues that these amendments uh, produce, uh, and that means that I shall deal with themes rather than individual per amendments per se, but these apply to individual amendments. I shall not be rehearsing the uh, stage one arguments as the, uh, Joanne Lamott has indicated that she didn't want to hear. I wouldn't want to be made to sit down uh, as I was uh, uh, doing this. I want to give the members an overview of the government's approach and to highlight a few particular areas. But let me just tell members where we are in terms of the overall context of discussions with the UK government on withdrawal from the EU and the devolution settlements. I can confirm those things stand. The government remains of the view it's necessary to proceed with this legislation. All along, the objective of the government and the Welsh government has been to reach agreement on amendments to the UK government's withdrawal bill, amendments that would address the concerns of all parties in the parliament. And sadly, we haven't yet reached such an agreement. And indeed, yesterday, the government lodged in the House of Lords their amendment to replace the existing Clause 11, which unacceptably constrains devolved competence. That amendment hasn't been agreed by the Scottish and Welsh governments for the reason I set out in my letter to all members yesterday. The UK, of course. Adam Tompkins. Intervention. The, the Minister will know well that the Finance Committee of this Parliament unanimously recommended that Clause 11 needed to be replaced or removed. I note that he's just used the word replaced, 
the government have lodged now an amendment that replaces Clause 11. Will the Minister not, rec not welcome that? I, I, I have indeed welcomed it on previous occasions, and I welcomed it in the letter that the member would have had yesterday, which I sent to all members. Unfortunately, it does not re replace it in the way that we require to have it replaced, but a process, progress has been made. I keep saying that. We're trying to keep going with that pr progress. Um, I welcome the progress the UK government has made. I welcome Mr. Liddington's comments on reaching agreement with the devolved administrations, which he also seeks. Obviously, the new clause would require the consent of the Parliament, so that's going to be needed. It's welcome he's committed to further discussions. And in that spirit, the Welsh and Scottish governments offered new proposals on Thursday that we believe would take care of the UK government's concerns, including a commitment not to, withhold, to not withholding agreement unreasonably and to a written agreement on these matters. Those offers remain on the table, and tomorrow there is a meeting of the JMC plenary, uh, which the First Minister will attend. I remain hopeful agreement can be reached. But we're not at that stage, and this Parliament needs to have a backstop. It needs to have this bill. I should also mention that last Friday, the UK government published a list of 24 areas for potential UK-wide frameworks, and I wrote to members on Friday with that list. I would emphasize that list was again prepared without consultation and without the agreement of the Welsh and Scottish governments. Nevertheless, we're prepared to agree to publication in the interest of transparency. The Scottish Government is now considering the list in detail for further discussions with the UK Government. So last, last week, the Minister told us that he couldn't publish the list because he didn't have agreement by the other two parties. The list has now been published yeah. by one of those parties, yeah. presumably without the agreement of the other two. Yeah. And now <coughs> we have a dispute about the list. So when will the Cabinet Secretary produce his little list so we can compare the two? Minister. Well, Standing officer, I'm quite happy to release the December list and that will indicate the changes. But I, I did stress, I've just, I've just said, well, I, I'm happy to do so, and I will do so, but let, because I was waiting, as the member knows, and let me just be, presiding officer, I'm, I'm trying to do this constructively. I was waiting to have the agreement of three parties. What happened on Thursday was that the UK government produced a different version of the list without consulting either governments, without actually telling either governments that they were going to do so. The two governments, the Welsh government ourselves, agreed that they, this should be published because we believe in transparency. We said publish it. But it is entirely fair to indicate that this was jumped on the two governments without any possibility of saying, for example, there's a new category in this list of reserved matters, which has not been in previous lists. And we dispute, for example, two of the items on the reserved list. But if, I'm happy to publish the December list. I don't think I'm under, under any... Cons any I don't think I'm under any constraints now, but the Scottish and Welsh governments behave correctly and honourably in this matter and will continue to do so. Now let me turn to the amendments that have been tabled for Stage 2. Now I recognise that the procedure for this bill has been unusual, including this pre-Stage 2 debate, but there is enough time for the bill to be properly scrutinised and that's what will take place. And indeed the number and range of amendments it gives me some confidence that that is the case. A lot of work has been done into preparing, publishing, grouping, grouping those amendments to allow us to have Stage 2 today. I record my appreciation to members and to parliamentary officials and to civil servants for rising to this occasion. I'm confident in the bill. It takes a similar approach to many issues as the UK bill, but it's benefited substantially from the detailed scrutiny of that bill by committees of this parliament and at Westminster. It will continue to do so through Stage 2. We have a test of necessity before ministers can use powers in the bill. There's an enhanced affirmative procedure. There's a statutory requirement for UK ministers to seek the consent of Scottish ministers before using their powers, I want to make some progress, before using their powers in devolved areas. The Charter of Fundamental Rights will continue in devolved areas. We believe we've responded to the scrutiny of the parliament that's carried out in the UK's bill and the recommendations of committees. But we're keenly aware this is an unusual bill. It raises questions for the parliament. We will all feel uneasy about some of the necessary powers that the government is seeking to implement Brexit. These are powers that Brexit has insisted upon because the UK government is pursuing Brexit. But we're very open, I stress this absolutely, presiding officer, we're very open to suggested improvements. With that in mind, we have considered and will consider all the amendments carefully with a view of either accepting members' proposals or identifying issues we'd want to discuss further with a view to bringing amendments at stage three. There are a number of amendments we will be accepting tonight, which I will detail when we get into the formal proceedings. Even Conservative members might be surprised by some of them. 
There are also areas we don't think the amendments tabled are the right ones, where further discussion might lead us to an approach that does meet the members' concerns. No, I, I want to make some progress, Mr. Bibby. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have unlimited time available to me. I want now briefly to highlight a few major areas that emerge from the amendments to give members a flavour of the government approach. First of all, on scope and scrutiny of ministers' powers. At the heart of concerns about the bill are the scope of ministers' powers to change legislation and the scrutiny of those powers. Members have proposed various constraints and limitations to those powers. There are also proposals to make necessity the test, not just for using the powers, but the way in which ministers propose to fix deficiencies. Ross Greer has proposed an additional step to allow Parliament to consider the procedures to be adopted. Now, I find myself sympathetic to many of these amendments and their intention, if not their detail. But I also have to consider the purpose of the bill and the practical challenge that lies ahead of this Parliament and the government in readying devolved law for Brexit, which regrettably we have to do. And in these circumstances, there's a balance to be struck, as we've always said, in creating a workable and practical system that will allow the proper level of scrutiny of the legislation to be passed within the time available. Members will be aware that parliamentary and Scottish government officials are working together to address a number of legislative matters that will arise as a consequence of Brexit. First and foremost, these discussions will help to ensure there's a shared understanding of the programme of SSIs which will be required, their timing, their relative significance. They're also drafting a protocol that sets out the procedure by which the Scottish Parliament will scrutinise the consent of Scottish ministers to legislative deficiencies being corrected in UK statutory instruments. That detailed and technical work is ongoing and is one part of the government's commitment to ensure that the Parliament has the ability to scrutinise all aspects of the legislative implications. I remain of the view that good working arrangements that create confidence but can be used flexibly is a better approach than mere statutory procedural requirements. That was the overall approach endorsed by the Delegated Powers Committee to the UK Bill. I think that conclusion is valid for the Continuity Bill. Having said that, the government recognises there may be changes to the detail of scrutiny, for example, where affirmative or enhanced affirmative procedures are required that could appear in the bill, and we will discuss that this evening. We ha I have mentioned the keeping pace power, and I give the commitment, as I have already done, that we will look at the areas of concern, the scope of the power, the procedure for the power, the length of time the power lasts, the effect of the use of the power in other parts of the UK. And of course there is, as Mr Finlay has raised, the question of whether the power should be in the bill at all. I will talk to all those amendments at stage two. The government has also lodged an amendment to clarify the issue of how long the power lasts and how it is extendable. My general approach is that I understand concerns. We may not accept all the amendments today, but we'll be looking at to address the views expressed, possibly by amendments at stage three. Another group of amendments, presiding officer, concerns environmental protect protections. I gave evidence on that issue this morning to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, and I've had discussions with individual members about it. Uh, I have considerable sympathy with the purpose of these amendments. Members will have seen or may have seen my letter to Graham Day yesterday as convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. I don't consider the approach of the amendments provides the best way to achieve the results that are being sought and with which I agree, but we are trying to find a possible way to do so. Final issue I want to mention, presiding office exit day. At the Delegated Powers Committee last week, I understood to consider this further. I did indeed have an amendment drafted to make the intention clearer. I'm pleased to say we've not had to table that amendment. We'll be able to accept a proposed amendment on the issue that has been lodged. Presiding officer, this debate is an opportunity for members to express their views on the amendments before us to inform stage two later today. I look forward to hearing those views and I'll take them into account when we come to the formal stage two later today. Thank you very much. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we said when this bill was introduced into this Parliament a fortnight ago that it was unnecessary because uh, the European Union Withdrawal Bill, and in particular Clause 11 of that bill, would be amended. That claim has now been vindicated because the United Kingdom Government has indeed laid an amendment in the House of Lords to Clause 11 uh, of the Withdrawal Bill. Not merely an amendment, Presiding Officer, but a provision that flips Clause 11 entirely on its head. The Finance and Constitution Committee unanimously recommended that Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill needed to be replaced or removed, and we've just heard from the Minister's own mouth his recognition 
uh, that, it, that is exactly what this amendment does. It replaces Clause 11 so that all powers that fall within devolved competence will uh, come here rather than rest in Westminster for an undisclosed uh, period. Um, in addition to that, we have the transparency from the United Kingdom government, but not, it should be noted, from the Scottish government, um, uh, that we now know where the areas are where the United Kingdom government is of the view that there needs to be a UK common framework, whether legislatively or non-legislatively, let me finish this point and then I'll let Mr Stevenson in, whether legislatively or non-legislatively, to protect the legitimate interests of the United Kingdom such that Brexit does not allow the integrity of the United Kingdom to be unpicked uh, inadvertently uh, or indeed deliberately by any uh, government at any uh, layer. That transparency at the UK level should by now have been replicated by the Scottish, uh, at Scottish level and I... I I absolutely associate myself with the remarks from the Labour benches about the disappointment, shall we put it politely, that that has not yet happened. Happy to give away to Mr Stevenson. Joe Stevenson. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. Does that uh, mean that uh, Mr Tompkins will not be pursuing amendments 150 and 151? 150 being the amendment that means in a protected field that we require the consent of a Minister of the Crown, in other words, elsewhere. And in 151, re-reserves uh, to Westminster, agriculture, environmental protection, fisheries, public procurement and state aid. Because that seems at odds with what uh, Mr Tompkins has just said about returning powers uh, to Scotland. Adam Tompkins. I'm grateful for that question, I, I think the, for that intervention. I think that those amendments are uh, amongst the most important amendments that uh, have been put down to this bill because they sketch, it seems to me, uh, what a solution to the Clause 11 issue uh, would uh, look like. Now, M Mr Russell wrote to all members yesterday in response to the uh, UK government's amendment, um, and he said amongst a number of points which I disagree with, he did say something that I agree with. He said that the Scottish Parliament is being asked to agree these amendments with no certainty about the areas in which frameworks will be established. Now, I am and always have been of the view that there is no reason why the withdrawal bill should not specify on its face the areas where frameworks are needed, whether those frameworks are legislative or non-legislative. I think if the withdrawal bill were to be amended to do that, I think the Clause 11 issue would be solved and we could dispense with this woeful piece of emergency legislation which will do nothing but bring this parliament into disrepute and, and carry on with more uh, important matters. So, no, I won't be withdrawing those amendments. I will be uh, looking forward this evening to the debate on those amendments because I think they raise issues which go to the crux of the disagreement between the Scottish and the UK government. They go to the crux of the issues raised by the Finance and Constitution Committee, which will be, which will be uh, um, debating those, uh, those issues uh, this evening. Presenting officer, the... Yes. John Sweeney. I'm grateful to Mr Tompkins. On that question of the, the, the crux of this matter, where does he stand on the question of whether or not the consent of the Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament should be obtained on questions and frameworks which are already within the devolved competence of this Parliament. Adam Tompkins. I, I stand four square with the Secretary of State for Scotland who has said on the record both in this Parliament, Mr Swinney, and in the House of Commons that it is his view and it is the government's view, the United Kingdom government's view that common frameworks must be agreed between the governments of these nations and not imposed by any government on any other. That is the view of the UK government and it has been for months and I am surprised that Mr Swinney did not already uh, know that. When they were introducing this legislation uh, a fortnight ago, presiding officer, um, Scottish government ministers... Uh, Mr. Scot Swinney. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Thompson. Can he clarify for me then uh, whether he believes that the bill provides for the statement he has just made to Parliament? Adam Jenkins. There is nothing in the continuity bill at all, Mr. Swinney, about common frameworks. This is a debate, this is a debate, Mr. Sweeney, I'm trying to deal with the second intervention you've already made on my, on my speech. This is a debate this afternoon uh, on stage two of the bill that you have signed your name to, um, that is a Scottish Government bill in the Scottish Parliament, the Continuity Bill, and there is not a word in the Continuity Bill anywhere about common frameworks. The Scottish ministers, Scottish ministers have said repeatedly, and I have welcomed repeatedly, the fact that Scottish ministers have said that they see the need for common frameworks. So why is there nothing in the bill that you introduced less than a fortnight ago, that you put your name to less than a fortnight ago, why is there nothing in that legislation on common frameworks, whatever? What, they, what we're seeing from the SNP is that they say one thing, but when it comes to producing legislation, they do quite another. And I need, I'll, I'll take... I'll, 
Lobster's <laughs> choice. A choice. Do I do I have do I have a choice? I'll take Mr. Russell. Oh, it's, a very, Russell. it's a very small point, and I'm grateful to 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 whichever member gave way. Um, <laughs> a, it's a very small point. Is the amendment as tabled by the UK government in the House of Lords yesterday? Does it give effect to what Mr. Tompkins has said in terms of the agreement by the devolved legislatures or administrations to those frameworks? Does it allow agreement as opposed to consultation? It, cer it certainly does allow agreement. It, it certainly does. It certainly does allow agreement. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very interestingly worded question, Mr. Russell, and the answer is yes, that amendment allows agreement. I want to move on. I, I want to move on. <laughs> uh, I, 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 would, I would really like to take as many interventions from the government front bench as I can, presiding officer, but I am conscious of time. Yes. I didn't impose the time constraints on this parliamentary business. Mm. The SNP did. Mr. Mr. Tompkins, I, I would suggest, Mr. Tompkins, it, it, I, I, I know the point Mr. Tompkins speaks. It's entirely up to Mr. Tompkins how many interventions he takes. Uh, I would uh, stress, however, that I will be as flexible as possible in terms of the time I'm allocating to Mr. Tompkins. The importance of the matter presenting officer, I'm perfectly happy to take one more intervention from Mr. Swinney, but then I will have to make progress and conclude my remarks. Uh, Mr. Swinney. Can, can I just press Mr. Tompkins, because this is an absolutely yep. central issue. Does the amendment tabled by the United Kingdom uh, to provide for frameworks require the UK government to seek the agreement of the Scottish Government? Adam Tompkins. I, I have already said that that amendment allows agreement to be pursued. Yeah. I have already said, and, 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 and Mr Swinney, I have already said that I agree with the point that Mr Russell made in his letter to all MSPs yesterday, that it would be useful and beneficial if the, am if the amendment could identify the substantive areas in which common frameworks will be required. That has been my position for months and it continues to be my position. I've said that very clearly on the record and I hope that's a helpful response, Mr Swinney. I want to say, finally, presenting off some, something about the vexed issue of legislative competence. Um, when the Lord Advocate came to this chamber uh, to express his view about legislative competence, the debate was almost exclusively focused on the question of whether this bill is compatible um, with the requirement on this Parliament not to legislate in breach of European Union law. And a number of us asked him questions about whether there were any other issues of competence that are raised by this bill. And I have to say, presiding officer, that a more detailed examination that we've now been able to give to this bill than, than, than was the case when the Lord Advocate was here would reveal that there are indeed a number of provisions that are manifestly and straightforwardly incompatible with the requirements imposed on us by the Scotland Act. The Scotland Act unambiguously states that this Parliament has no legislative competence to modify the Scotland Act. There are then a number of provisions that are saved from that provision. So there are a number of detailed issues with regard to the Scotland Act that notwithstanding that broad uh, restriction, we are able to modify. But one of the provisions of the Scotland Act that we are unambiguously unable to modify is section 29, which is the provision of the Scotland Act that put, imposes constraints on our legislative competence. When we turn to section 33 of the Continuity Bill, um, we see that section 29 is amended, as is section 57 too. These are provisions which it is manifestly incompetent for us to amend. These are provisions which are unlawful, these are provisions which, if they are tested in court, and I hope that we never have to go to court because I hope that the SNP sees the wisdom of the merit of withdrawing this bill before it goes any further, but if these are tested in court, I have to say I find it extremely difficult to see how this Parliament's legislation, if this is enacted, is going to stand uh, judicial uh, scrutiny. We have been vindicated on these benches, presiding officer, in our claim that this bill is unnecessary because the withdrawal bill would be amended. We have been vindicated just a few moments ago in our claim on these benches, presiding officer, that it is dangerous to proceed in haste with regard to this bill. We now know that the Finance Committee might have to meet tomorrow as well as today to consider the amendments that we've brought forward. I hope that I'm not going to be vindicated for a third time when I say that this bill brings the Parliament into disrepute and, fa um, and risks failing in the courts. It's not too late for the SNP to withdraw this bill. It's bad law. We should abandon it and not enact it. Thank you. I call on Neil Findlay. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, I don't like you, be, you being used as a, a pawn in a game of political brinkmanship. I, I don't like it when two 
governments for their own narrow party advantage seek to exploit a situation for their own ends. And that appears to be what is happening here. We have the Scottish Government trying to stoke up this dispute and the Tories who marched their troops to the top of the hill only to see them falling over the edge when David Mundell and Ruth Davidson failed to deliver, digging their heels in, prolonging an avoidable situation. Last week I called for the list of the 25 disputed areas to be published. The Cabinet Secretary has told us he couldn't do so without the authority of the UK and Welsh Assembly. Then the UK Government published the list. The Minister in his letter told us he doesn't agree with it. But now that they have published, surely he can publish. Presumably there's now nothing stopping him. At 2.22, two minutes after I sat down, I received a reply from the Minister on that very question, which said, I will reply to the member as soon as possible. So I ask the Minister, he could have published five minutes after the UK Government published. Will he publish today? Minister. I'm happy to be a member because he's labouring under a misapprehension, but I'll happily clear that, sort that misapprehension for him. The list of items was agreed in December as a negotiating list. That was the list I'd been happy to publish last week, but I felt it was right and decent to set, get the agreement of the Welsh, and there are three parties to this, of course, the Welsh and the UK governments. On uh, Thursday, that list was superseded by another list. That list contained many of the same subjects, indeed all of the same subjects, and it made some changes to categorisation. That list is, therefore contains the information, but it organises it differently. We disagree. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that the member, does not, the member over here does not understand this. Perhaps he should concentrate a little bit more on it. The reality is the list contains all the same items, but in order to make the member happy, I will make the list from December available. He will see what the UK government has done. He will also, I hope, note two things. One is, we did not approve, neither the Welsh nor ourselves approved that list. It was not, we were not consulted on this new list. And the second one is, we did approve its publication. Indeed, I asked that the meeting on Thursday be published that day. So we extended to the publication, and so did Mark Drakeford, my Welsh colleague, and we're as one of this. But I'm happy to let Mr Finlay have the list from December, and he will see the changes that have been made. Neil Finlay. Fine officer, I have to ask why it's like pulling teeth to get this information from the minister. He could have published ages ago. And, he can, and today he can publish his interpretation of that information, and that would give us a much clearer uh, view and more transparency because this process has not been good. No. This process today doesn't lend itself to the scrutiny of complex issues. We haven't had that appropriate time to discuss and reflect on amendments or even see the cause and effect of government amendment. It's ludicrous that we've got to this stage and that Labour amendments that would have developed an open, clear and transparent process of dispute resolution were rejected in the House of Commons by Tory MPs. And now we see a late in the day attempt in the House of Lords to make some progress. But that just doesn't cut it. Negotiations surely have to continue to find a solution so that this bill can be put to bed in an agreement put, place, put in place on devolved powers. Because the progress of this bill throws up many areas of concern. Now we all know that Mr Tompkins and his lawyer friends on the Tory benches, for them all their Christmases have come at once. I'm sure they sat up all night in their pyjamas giggling uncontrollably, drafting all of these ever so clever amendments in an attempt to sabotage the bill. And I'm sure the parliamentary draftsmen and women were all appreciative of the overtime and the cabinet secretary maybe had a few sleepless nights as a result. But may indeed get Adam Tompkins and his junior counsel to either side of him all hot and bothered. But not a person out there in the street cares about their games. What they do care about is their jobs, about low pay, about cuts to services, about the NHS, about housing costs, and about their kids' education. That's what they care about. And I wish Mr Tompkins and his chums there paid as much attention to these issues as they do about their little parliamentary games. And can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, get back round the table. This can be resolved with some give and take and common sense. The differences between the two sides are clearly not insurmountable. Negotiations over these areas must continue. If agreements can be reached in areas such as forestry, water quality, maritime employment rights, railways, crime and policing, areas of medicine, and much more, they can be found 
and the rest of the areas of dispute. But I have to say, given the track record of the government in some, for example, farm payments, then we can hardly be filled with confidence about their ability to administer them effectively. In relation to the amendments to the bill, uh, Neil Bibby and James Kelly have proposed a series of amendments focusing on protecting equality and environmental rights and, and those of workers and consumers. consumers. These are key labour demands all through the Brexit process. Section 13 of the bill gives Scottish ministers powers that go beyond the continuity, con continuity uh, uh, of EU law to create new laws. We are not opposed to creating legislation that ensures that Scotland's uh, devolved laws keep a pace, with, a pace with developments in the EU, EU after Brexit or indeed anywhere else across the world. But let th that legislation, uh, legislation like this should not be included in this rushed process. This clause gives ministers power to create new laws through le regulations and delegated, delegated powers which are subject to a lesser level of parliamentary scrutiny, taking powers away from parliament into the hands of the executive. Cabinet Secretary, this is a power grab too, and it's a ministerial one. If the government wants such wide-ranging powers, then they should bring it back in a separate piece of legislation so we can consider it fully through a normal bill timetable, not rush it through this process. And we have concerns about ministers having the ability to decide exit day and ministerial control in a number of other areas. And I've put down a series of amendments on these. Colin Smith and Claudia Beamish have brought forward amendments to enshrine environmental principles and animal, animal welfare standards in the bill, and they will address these in their contributions. President officer, from the outset, Scottish Labour has said we will defend devolution. We will seek to make this legislation better, and we will continue to do that throughout the bill. Finally, I have to say, President officer, I find it astonishing in such an important bill that is so important to the future of the country and 232 amendments, not one, not one has come from a government backbencher. They don't see themselves ever as parliamentarians. They see themselves as party hacks every single time. Thank you, Colin Mark Ruskell. Thank you, and can I declare an interest as a member of the British Veterinary Association? Presiding officer, our shared European values have shaped the progress that we now enjoy. And the UK has worked for decades with other member states to deliver laws that give future generations the chance of inheriting a cleaner, healthier, and more compassionate world. The day we leave the European Union, we must not lose one single piece of pro progress that was hard won through suffering, through protest, through debate and action by citizens across Europe. This bill must hold on to the principles that protect our environment and the welfare of animals. And these principles must be the guiding foundations for our future, to be built on, not to be dismantled. While the Charter of Fundamental Rights that is now enshrined in the bill establishes the need to protect our environment, it doesn't incorporate the precautionary or other principles, despite what the minister said in committee this morning. Many members will be familiar with these principles. They're part of our everyday language. And I'm sure most members in this chamber believe that polluters should pay or that we should look before we leap and apply the precautionary principle when the picture of hazards and risks is far from clear. But these principles are under attack, make no mistake. Salmon farming industrialists have spoken in this parliament recently about regulations being over precautionary while they pollute the seabed with chemicals that we neither measure or fully understand the impact of. Now is not the time to be weakening protection for the environment. It's time to be deepening and strengthening it. Now, the minister talks of the powers in this bill to keep pace with European laws. But I am worried that what we'll get is a principles pick and mix, with governments ever happy to apply a precautionary approach to food safety, but not to fisheries policy. I don't want to see a pick and mix approach to the principle of animal sentience either. This isn't a debate about whether animals can feel pain. It's about why the welfare of animals always needs to be a consideration when developing future policy on trade, on research, on agriculture, and on fisheries. And Fergus Ewing's knee-jerk reaction to condemn the UK government when it announced it would support a ban on live animal exports is the biggest warning side yet that the political choices, as the minister put it this morning in committee, on keeping pace provisions could undermine the, guide, the guiding principles 
that we have. We have good animal welfare laws in Scotland, but they are limited in their scope. And the Article 13 provision on animal sentience is not perfect either, but it is strong enough to save and build on, keeping pace with our scientific understanding of welfare issues. And if the Minister believes there is a better way to enshrine these guiding principles into legislation, then let's see an amendment now, rather than hoping Westminster might legislate for us, as is the current Scottish Government position on animal welfare. Turning to the requirements in this bill for EU case law to have tested general principles to destruction, we can see where the precautionary and other principles have been applied already. But context is important, and vested interests will hunt for reasons why their situation apparently differs. And that's why my amendment disapplies the legal case law test for these principles, because our environment is vast, complex, and diverse, while technology and industry is continually evolving. So the application of these principles should not be restricted simply to existing case law on day one. Presiding officer, this bill must also point to the bodies that will take on new duties to watch, measure, and protect our environment after withdrawal. Bodies that can hold up a mirror and a stick to governments when they put our environment in danger. That's the purpose behind two further amendments I've lodged to close the governance gap. Because without the ultimate threat of action by the European Court of Justice on the UK and the Scottish Government's record on air quality, I doubt we would have had the new commitments on low emission zones in the programme for government last year. The creation of an environment commissioner is needed alongside an environmental court. And the government must think again on this and commit in this bill to a consultation process as the Westminster government has already done. Presiding officer, this bill is a necessary response to the chaos of Brexit process, but it must not replicate the errors of the UK bill. It must switch on Scotland as a progressive beacon in these aisles, guiding progress for future generations to come. Thank you. I call on Tavish Scott. Thank you, Mr. I have some regard for Joanne Lamont's point about the process of this Parliament, and I very much take the advice that you gave to the Chamber at the, uh, at the beginning of this debate this afternoon about the discussion between business managers and the way in which uh, this place has considered it appropriate to take forward uh, these measures. But I was reminded by um, a colleague from Westminster last night that um, the Westminster has dealt with the uh, UK bill over many, many weeks indeed, indeed months, across of course two uh, houses, but that's uh, not the point. It's that uh, they have taken uh, some considerable time and there's still much to go. And I think that uh, point is, is important for the government here in Edinburgh to consider because given uh, the length of time we are having to deal with this bill and given the uh, shortness, uh, although it won't feel like that come 10 o'clock tonight, but the shortness of the period uh, that the committee is going to take stage two amendments and deliberate on those two stage two amendments, I do believe there is a significant onus on ministers to recognise um, opposition amendments when they do have merit uh, and to uh, give way on those uh, where uh, there frankly isn't much of an argument the other way. Not because the government don't have an argument, but much because we haven't had time to reflect on those amendments, we haven't had a time to consider those amendments in depth, and we haven't had a time uh, to, get, to go back and look at those amendments uh, over a period uh, of, of uh, time. Now, Joanne Lamont um, has much hinted that we could have been rerunning um, last week uh, today. I suppose a number of things have happened since last week. Um, Mr. Russell has certainly written many letters. He's no doubt appeared before many committees as well, although in, in itself even that is a challenge because I have not had a chance to catch up on the official report of this morning, even if it is yet available. And I entirely take the presiding officer's point that uh, the clerks have been doing some job in terms of both handling of amendments and also keeping members up to date with the proceedings of, of uh, committees. Uh, but uh, that has certainly happened. There has been indeed a, a JMC Europe, a, a joint ministerial committee in Europe, and tomorrow there's going to be one involving obviously the Prime Minister and the, and the First Minister uh, as well. And, and those are important staging posts in that. We, uh, we, could, read, we could read much into Adam Tompkins' um, uh, debate across the front bench as to what has happened in, in, in uh, terms of removing Clause 11, or deleting Clause 11 of the UK Government, uh, the European Union uh, Withdrawal uh, Bill. But it seems to me the point 
here um, that uh, I'm not quite sure he entirely conceded in all those interventions was that the frameworks that, uh, that are absolutely fundamental to uh, many of the constituents that uh, we all are here to represent, those frameworks have to be agreed between the different governments of the United Kingdom, not, a pr not uh, laid down by Westminster and then subsequently then enacted by other governments. They have to be agreed between all the governments of the United Kingdom in order for those frameworks to work. And I want to give two examples to Mr. Tompkins and to... Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. John Sweeney. go again. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Scott for giving way because that is exactly the point that I was making in my interventions to Adam Tompkins because I cannot see how we can, in all honesty as a parliament, agree to the revised terms of the Clause 11 in the UK Bill because it does not make provision for the agreement of this parliament or this government to be required. And without that, we will have things done to us in devolved competence that the founders of our parliament would not have approved of. I, I take that point from the Deputy First Minister and agree with it, although I think it also makes the case for a dispute resolution mechanism which we uh, have yet to fully come to terms with. I used to sit in the last Parliament on a committee chaired by Bruce Crawford who looked at intergovernmental machinery. Uh, we did uh, some considerable work on this, uh, but as yet we do not have in place across this the United Kingdom a mechanism to deal with uh, uh, solving disputes, uh, which we certainly are in uh, at this time in relation to frameworks. But I take the, I take the point the uh, Deputy First, First Minister uh, makes. The two examples I want to give uh, are firstly on fisheries because that has, um, that has certainly been um, of late in the news. The Chancellor of the Exchequer um, opined the other day, as far as I could see, that fisheries could be tradable uh, in the negotiations that the UK Government will have at some stage on trade with the rest of the uh, European uh, Union. Well, the alarm bells certainly went off in Lerwick. I'm sure they went off in pretty well other, every other fishing port across, the, uh, across Scotland as well, and actually probably quite a lot in Cornwall and many ports in England uh, uh, as well. Uh, and I saw he was pulled back into, pulled back into line uh, fairly shortly after, therefore, by uh, Michael Gove, although Mr. Gove always worries me greatly because it seems to me his intentions are to become Prime Minister rather than stay in the job of, of uh, Environment and Fisheries Minister in England for much uh, longer. And the second example is on agriculture, because those, those are the two industries where, uh, where the framework really does uh, matter. I know they absolutely matter in, in many areas of public policy, but certainly in these uh, areas, they absolutely matter. And that is, the, the reason this matters here is because we in Scotland do take a different view to how we structure agricultural support in Scotland. It's very different south of the border. As anyone who went to the NFU AGM and listened to colleagues from England explaining their system uh, did that night. And I, it is important, therefore, that framework is agreed across the, uh, the nations and indeed uh, the uh, governments of the, of the United Kingdom. And not imposed. It cannot be imposed. It must be agreed. For, the, for, for many other reasons, but particularly in the case of those two uh, principal uh, industries. Now, in terms of um, the Liberal Democrats in this bill, we, uh, we will scrutinise this bill. We have laid um, a number of, of amendments, and I certainly don't plan to uh, speak for hours upon hours. I was reminded the other day that, that I think Fergus Ewing has the record of speaking to an amendment at a stage two in committee back in, I think, the second session. And I think he spoke for just over an hour, and I countenance against Adam Tompkins doing that, uh, uh, doing that tonight. Although it was a very good speech, I, I think I remember. Yeah. Michael Russell. I think it's absolutely clear that I am willing to pledge myself not to do so. If he pledges himself, perhaps Mr. Tompkins would like to do so too. Tavishkot. I was hoping that uh, we could agree on that, but um, let me, let me recognise that that scrutiny role uh, is important. We want to, uh, uh, to look at three particular measures uh, this, after, or this evening in, in terms of amendments. The first is on, is on uh, Section uh, 13 and on what I suppose has now described as keeping pace with the uh, European Union. We believe this uh, goes too far. It overreaches uh, the measures that uh, I think are appropriate for any government of any political uh, persuasion. Mm -hmm. And the principal, uh, 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 the principal measure we wish to propose in terms of uh, amending that section is to ensure that, uh, go that government ministers um, bring back a, a proposal in terms of when this, uh, why they would need this power, but to do it uh, through a proper parliamentary process uh, with plenty of scrutiny and plenty of appropriate time to reflect uh, upon that. Because it's not an emergency, this particular part of the bill. I, I can take the arguments that, uh, that uh, the minister makes in terms of the uh, timetabling of this bill uh, today and next week, but this particular section is not an emergency. This could be done properly and with careful 
careful consideration, um, given its import into our way of doing things um, in, in due course, uh, arguably later uh, in, this, in this year. And I, I'd hope the Minister will listen to that argument and, and deal with it. Two other areas I want to just briefly uh, mention, uh, uh, Deputy Pres uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, the first are, are around regulations to create new quangos. Now, it cannot be right to, to use regulation to create a new quangos. If the government wishes to bring forward and has reason, which they may well do, any government may well have reason to do that, then that should be brought forward as, as it has in the past by primary legislation and doing that correctly. And similarly in law, where, there are, where we could have circumstances if we allowed the bill to go through unamendment, uh, unamended to create new criminal offences. I suspect um, our uh, learned friends in the, in, the law, in the profession of law would wish to make sure that in creating any such new criminal offences, that again is done under the full scrutiny of parliamentary uh, of parliament rather than by, uh, rather than by regulation. And it is in, the, in those spirit, presiding officer, that we bring forward amendments uh, this afternoon and indeed this evening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And I call on John McAlpine to be followed by Donald Cameron. John McAlpine. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to speak in this debate of the Continuity Bill in advance of Stage 2 today, particularly as a number of developments have taken place since we last debated the Bill last week. The Minister has said that UK Ministers met with the Scottish and Welsh Governments but failed to reach agreement again. The UK Government has tabled its own amendments in the House of Lords, as we've heard. The Scottish Government has offered compromise and the UK government has published its list of proposed evolved frameworks. There's also, quite out of the blue, a new list of powers, such as on state aid and procurement, which the UK government claim is reserved, and the devolved government's dispute. That underlines the need for this continuity bill we debate today, and therefore my speech today will focus on the need for these frameworks, and that is frameworks which are democratically agreed and not imposed on Scotland and Wales. Take back control was described by some as an attack on elites. Indeed, it became the terrorist chant of the Brexiteer ultras. But in a supreme irony, the UK-EU withdrawal bill hands control not to the people, but to one of the most elite groups within the UK, Tory ministers. The ultras demand an end of all constraints, legal, political, uh, or even international, which could limit UK ministers, except by a UK parliament, which can never adequately represent the people of Scotland. Scotland is just 59 seats out of 650 in the Westminster Parliament. It can never represent us adequately. And yet here we see Westminster grabbing powers from a parliament which has 100% representation from Scotland. Yes. Yeah, beacon of consistency in that she would say that this parliament should not cede powers to ministers. Jim McAlvin. Well, I think the Minister's made it very clear that he's listening to um, what the opposition. The Minister's made it very clear. Yeah, the Minister's very, made it very clear that he is listening and that these amendments will be uh, debated later uh, in the Finance and Constitution Committee. Adam Ad Jumpkins. Yes. Could the member just indicate which um, amendments she thinks the Finance and Constitution Committee should accept this evening? John McAlpine. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to preempt the Finance and Constitution Committee. I don't sit on the Finance and Constitution Committee, and therefore I think that would be very, very inappropriate. I touched on the theme last week in my speech on the contrasting operation of the EU single market uh, with the system as yet undefined UK ministers want to impose on us. The rules and regulations of the single market are created under leadership of commissioners appointed by democratically elected member state governments and agreed by those governments within the Council and the members of the European Parliament. They are enforced by a series of agencies in the Court of Justice of the European Union, mechanisms that we will leave in 12 months' time. What will replace legally enforceable checks and balances across the UK once we leave the single market? Professor Michael Keating, one of the experts in this area, has already said it's not at all clear. And I would contend that UK ministers clearly plan further centralisation and the triumph of their will. And yesterday's amendments tabled to the House of Lords by the UK government confirm this. They set out that UK ministers would only be under a duty to consult the devolved administrations and provide information to the UK Parliament on the effect of the regulations and the consultation it took from those devolved administrations. That is not agreement. It is therefore unacceptable and reverses the devolution settlement that 74% of Scots voted for in 1997. The UK government's actions since 2016 show that their agreement 
Uh, their idea of consultation, never mind agreement, is deeply flawed. They cannot be trusted to treat the devolved administrations with respect. That lack of respect, which has coloured the entire GMC-EN process around Brexit, was on display again last week with the publication of UK, by the UK Government of the analysis of the devolved frameworks. The Minister says that neither he nor, nor his Welsh counterpart were consulted on the list that was published, and that's not the respect agenda. Of course, we need frameworks, but they must be meaningful. They must be arrived at through mutual consent. There are serious real dangers in the material published on Friday, not least the surprise news that the UK are insisting that rules around procurement and state aid are, in their view, reserved. Given the very different political direction between the Scotland and the UK for many years on these issues, it's a very real and deep concern. Do we really want to see this right wing or future right wing UK governments interfering in what support Scottish governments give to Scottish businesses to protect Scottish jobs? Without agreement, there is no guarantee that the UK will give us the power to protect standards of it, whether we will be forced to lower them to match whatever trade deal Liam Fox agrees to. The EU single market has not been without controversy, but the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality were built into the treaties of the EU to protect the powers of parliaments like this. Subsidiarity in particular is pertinent as it illustrates the difference between what we have now and what we could have if we do not gain the guarantees we need. The Law Society brief for this bill describes it as aiming to ensure that decisions are taken as closely as possible to the citizen and that constant checks are made to verify that action at EU level is justified in the light of the possibilities available at national, regional and local level. Nothing like this exists, exists in the devolution settlement. The EU is an organisation that pools sovereignty from independent member states to give them greater influence on their shared values. As shown by the UK government's actions in the last 24 hours, their ideas are very different. We will be consulted only, and despite being assured of a power bonanza, we find out that the principles under which this parliament was founded will be undermined. Whose sovereignty did the Brexiteers mean when they spoke of taking back control? It appears parliamentary sovereignty applies to Westminster, to the House of Commons, but not to this chamber. We as MSPs are simply in the way, an annoyance to be ignored or trampled over on the way to Brexit. I am shocked and disappointed, but frankly, not surprised. Thank you. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Cameron, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, bearing in mind Joanne Lamont's uh, strictures and the four minutes I have, I'd like to go straight to uh, the amendments that I move in, in my name. Um, these amendments seek to provide greater clarity to sections of the bill, and I hope that members across this chamber will give them due consideration. With respect to principles of EU law as set out in section 5, I have suggested an amendment which seeks to clarify which principles are to be included in the bill. The Law Society of Scotland identified this issue, suggesting it would be helpful, and I quote, if the government could identify what general principles it considers are retained in Scots law. And given that there are several legal principles at stake, I agree with the Law Society that it is important that this is duly clarified. The Law Society also raised concerns over the approach taken in section 6, subsection 1. They argue that the line in, in that sub, subsection has no obvious intended effect, and I therefore have lodged an amendment indicating that this section is only a declaratory provision. In relation to the keeping pace powers in section 13, like many others, I remain deeply concerned at the ability of Scottish ministers to hold full power in section 13 to make provision corresponding to EU law after exit day. I've suggested an amendment be added to the bill which will make this subject to the restrictions and limitations of the Scotland Act on making provision on devolved and reserved matters and the Scottish Parliament giving its consent. And I hope that others in this chamber will at least agree that ministers should not have full control without oversight in this regard and without the overarching protection provided by the devolution settlement as enshrined in the Scotland Act 1998. In relation to section 14, there are elements in my view which require uh, correction and clarity. First, I've suggested an amendment which would mean that where a draft uh, SSI to which subsection 5b applies is laid, uh, the Scottish ministers must explain to the Scottish Parliament as opposed to the presiding officer. Similarly, this explanation should be provided within a set time frame as opposed to the uh, as soon as practicable provision 
and I have suggested uh, two sitting days. In addition to this, I have suggested an additional subsection uh, which would ensure that when such an SSI is laid on a day when Parliament is in recess, ministers are held accountable and must explain why this has occurred. And I have also sought to provide a definition of what constitutes a sitting day. And finally, I also believe that clarity is required with respect to legislative competence and also the meaning of exit day. First and foremost, I have moved in my amendment that section 28 should be removed from the bill altogether. And while the Law Society of Scotland has suggested that section 28 should be amended to reflect the exit day uh, noted in the UK bill, um, I do not see the necessity for that. And we do not feel that the exit day should be determined by Scottish ministers and potentially act in conflict with the exit day as set out in the UK bill. I've also included additional amendments to various lines across sections 5, 12 and 13 to reassert the importance of the Scotland Act 1998 and in particular areas which are either devolved or reserved. Ultimately, no area of this bill should attempt to supersede that act. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do not believe that we should be having this debate in this manner, and it is clear that more time is required to discuss the bill further. Nonetheless, I hope that members will view my amendments and those submitted by my colleagues as useful and seeking to add greater clarity to this bill. Uh, on these benches, we will listen and scrutinise the amendments of members across the chamber, and where there is common ground, they will have our support. But fundamentally, we remain opposed to this bill. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr McMillan, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, it's clear that this debate will quickly be overtaken uh, by the Stage 2 Committee that follows. But uh, irrespective as to what amendments are passed tonight, we need to try and protect this Parliament, but also the powers of devolution for this Parliament. I'm glad that uh, the Minister was speaking earlier on regarding Amendment 35, and that's uh, the one in Section 13, uh, and he stated that uh, he certainly would not be supporting that particular amendment. That's something that I'm pleased to hear the Minister actually state. Uh, but this bill is... Can that point? Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to Mr McMillan for giving way. Which amendments does he believe uh, the Finance and Constitution Committee should accept this evening? Stuart McMillan. Well, I'm sure if Mr Fraser wants to listen, then he will hear uh, as I progress with my speech. Uh, this bill is contingency planning, and any government that didn't plan for the worst uh, in the crisis situation that the UK uh, now faces would be undermining their electorate. And so irrespective as to which party or parties are actually running the Scottish Government, uh, they need to be undertaking planning to protect the interests of this Parliament and also of all of Scotland. Now, the purpose of the continuity bill is to ensure that Scotland's laws will work properly in the day uh, that the UK actually leaves the EU and the bill has been introduced because we recognise the need to prepare for that very serious legal consequence of actually leaving the EU. Now, despite uh, the short time frame, uh, this Scottish Government has committed to ensure that the Parliament can play the greatest possible role in scrutinising the bill. And uh, certainly, uh, as we already know, the Minister has appeared in front of a number of committees and he's going to have a, a long session ahead of him uh, this evening in front of the Finance and Constitution Committee, as well as others, no doubt, uh, as, we co as the process continues for the next week. But this pre-stage two debate uh, and also the nature of the Finance and Constitution Committee meeting this evening is that example of the, uh, of the openness and the transparency and also of the Minister prepared to actually work with this Parliament to get this bill through the parliamentary process. Now, Section 7, uh, we've got amendments 108 and 109. Uh, these have arisen from the work of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, Mr Fraser, uh, that, that we, had that, we did that work last week. Uh, and also uh, Section, uh, sorry, Amendment number 55, that's regarding Section 28, uh, of the bill. That's actually it was Mr uh, Finlay's amendment. Mr Russell uh, spoke in his earlier comments that, uh, that the Scottish Government were going to put forward an amendment on this particular section, but uh, as, uh, as a consequence of Mr Finlay putting his down first, they didn't see the need to do so. But I thought Mr Cameron's uh, comments a few moments ago were actually rather interesting regarding section 28, because it seemed to conflict uh, with the comments and discussions we've had in the De Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. So I'd be interested to hear, certainly from Mr Simpson, when he speaks uh, on that particular section later. Now, th th there needs to be that legal framework for keeping our laws uh, going at the point of EU withdrawal, presenting officer. And uh, if there wasn't, then many devolved areas, uh, but uh, many devolved laws and areas of the EU law would stop working, such as a system of agricultural support, uh, or the rules for ensuring food standards, and many others would become uncertain and unclear 
as to how they worked, such as our rules of environmental protection. However, the EU withdrawal bill allows Westminster to take control of devolved policy areas in order, according to the UK government, to allow UK-wide frameworks to be put in place after Brexit. But no matter which way we look at it, this whole debate about the existing powers of this Parliament in relation to the policy areas such as farming, fishing, justice and environment uh, is it's so crucial to this, what we are discussing today in this chamber. It's also about protecting, this bill, continuity bill, is about protecting the devolution agreement that people in Scotland voted for in 1997. It's the best way to run important national and local services like our NHS. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can't, I normally would, but I can't. Uh, it's the best way to, pro to provide agricultural support such as the less favoured area payments, essential in Scotland, but not used in England. It's the best way to devise procurement rules that are tailored to Scotland's needs. And it's the best way to protect and enhance our environment, consisting as it does of large areas of coast and sea. And the Scottish Government has acknowledged uh, the need for legislation of this kind since the, the, the publication of Scotland's Place in Europe in December 2016. Now that the UK Government has confirmed the power grab on uh, agriculture, fisheries, uh, procurement, state aid, GM crops, uh, it's, more, it's more reality. The public in Scotland should be fearful for their future. They should also be afraid for the economy, jobs and opportunities. This Tory power grab won't just steal powers from this parliament, it will steal jobs and opportunities from our constituents. Now, presiding officer, I urge, I urge every single member uh, of this chamber to support this Scottish Government and what they're trying to do. Uh, amendments that are going to take place this evening, and there's over 200 of them, so some will fail and some will pass. But I certainly urge every single member to think of their constituents, think of their regions, think of their constituencies, but also think of this Parliament and this Parliament's powers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Alison Harris. Ms Beamish, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we meet in this chamber to fight for what we already have important European legislation that improves all our lives, now at risk due to the arrogance of the Conservative Party and, indeed, since Brexit, their shambolic efforts ever since. As my colleague Neil Finlay said at Stage 1, we want devolution to work and we have a duty to make this continuity bill as good as it can be, in, although we hope it won't be needed in the end. That's perhaps a vain hope in view of the Tory party, but never mind. Um, this is incredibly important with regards to the environment and climate change, issues that quite obviously benefit from international effort. And I want to speak today about my amendments one and two and other amendments that relate both to environmental issues and to animal welfare. Our international commitments, including EU provisions, have been a key catalyst in Scotland becoming a leader on environmental protections and climate change reduction efforts. Directly transposing EU protections is a common sense approach and I and many others feel very uneasy in handing over the potential freedom to relax environmental standards. EU uh, environmental legislation has been instrumental with around 80% of Scottish environmental law originating there. We must maintain the more specific standards and targets that tend to be in EU legislation in contrast to domestic law prior to the EU that rested on broader statements. The Institute of European Policy, Environmental Policy said that lowering the standards would result in, I quote, real and uncertain environmental and, I stress, health risks. Air pollution is one of the biggest environmental health threats that we face. It's a damning example of environmental injustice disproportionately affecting children, the elderly, the ill and those living in poverty. The EU has been crucial in driving both the Scottish Government, in my view, and the EU Government for certain to do better obliging mandatory compliance under the Ambient Air Quality Directive. This is an example of things that we must not risk losing. Our seas also have been better protected and enhanced thanks to the leadership in legislation from the EU. And the Marine uh, Strategy Framework Directive and the Birds and Habitats Directives have again been crucial in passing the Marine Scotland Act and the subsequent development of both the Marine Plan and the vital marine protected areas. And indeed on land, the Birds and Habitat Directive raised the bar for, for uh, biodiversity protection across Europe. And Scotland is indeed an iconic home to flora and fauna. But the challenge of protecting them grows every day as our climate worsens. Domestic legislation enshrines these conservation efforts. But the potential for infraction proceedings depends on the details of Brexit yet to be confirmed. We can't allow ourselves to participate in a race to the bottom on environmental protections. 
Falling back on other international agreements also puts the environment at risk. Comparisons with the Berne Convention and the EU Habitats Directive show substantial difference that we cannot afford to sink to. Today, I do intend later to move my amendments to enshrine the principles of environment, environmental law into Scots law, whether they originate in the case law of the European Court, the EU treaties, direct EU legislation or EU directives. And my, my colleague Colin Smith's Amendment 3 does the same for the principle of animal welfare. Particularly important. No, I'm sorry, I haven't got time. I'm sorry, Mr. Stevenson. Particularly important as Scottish legislation on this issue is needing to be bolstered. And we will also support Mark Ruskell's amendment, very importantly, on uh, animal sentience. Uh, which is These issues must be recognised on the face of the bill, though. Across the chamber, we speak of sustainable development, progress with a suffusion of economic, social and environmental considerations. I quote from the Cabinet Secretary in his letter to my committee of yesterday, environmental protection is a core human right. These principles affect us all. And as a community activist fighting against inappropriate open caste, I was grateful for the precautionary principle, and I'm relieved this will be reflected in the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. However, in my view, we must go further, and I still argue for the inclusion on the face of the bill, my amendments one and two. I hear what the Cabinet Secretary said to our committee this morning on general principles enshrined in law as opposed to guiding principles, which it is argued are not. I also hear of his willingness to consider an equivalent in explanatory notes. And finally, I grasp the Cabinet Secretary's outline, I hope correctly, of the possibility of referring to future relevant legislation on the face of the bill. However, I will press my amendments later because I seek to be sure that we are robustly protecting our environment and our future of our planet. And I'm not convinced that we cannot have these protections on the face of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. There is a little time in hand, not a lot, but there is room for interventions. I will let members make up the time till we'll run out of the extra time. I call Alison Harris to be followed by Sandra White. Alison, please. Uh, Miss Harris, I should say. <laughs> Get a bit friendly with you <laughs> there. Okay. Don't know why that came over me. Uh, four right. minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I wish to declare that I'm a member of the DPLR committee. The Scottish Conservatives have been clear that the EU withdrawal bill, as drafted, would have to change if it was going to reflect the principles of the United Kingdom's devolved settlements. It was regrettable that amendments to the bill could not be tabled in time before the bill passed through the House of Commons, but amendments to the EU withdrawal bill should reflect discussions between the Scottish and UK governments. I am pleased that there has been progress in these negotiations, progress which the Minister referred to in his evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee last week. However, the stated intent of this bill is continuity, yet in reality this bill represents discontinuity and disruption. Discontinuity in this Parliament's tradition of debate, discussion and scrutiny and possible disruption to the process of negotiations between the UK and Scottish governments. It is, as my colleague Adam Tompkins said last week, a wrecking bill. I hope, as Mike Russell has stated, successful negotiations between the UK and Scottish governments will mean that the EU withdrawal bill can be satisfactorily amended and the bill before us will not have to come into effect. Nevertheless, as parliamentarians, it is incumbent on us to address deficiencies in legislation, however constricting the circumstances. Deputy Presiding Officer, I thank Mike Russell for making himself available to the committees of this Parliament to address the numerous problems this bill has created. Nonetheless, this is no substitute to the full process of parliamentary deliberation that such a significant bill needs. In the DPLR committee, I was able to share with Mike Russell my concerns about how little time the SNP government intends to allow Scotland's parliament to scrutinise this bill. The fact remains that one of the most significant pieces of proposed legislation in the Scottish parliament's history will be scrutinised in a period of less than a month. That's why the Scottish Conservatives have brought forward a series of amendments to address obvious deficiencies in this bill. As it stands, the bill creates extraordinary powers for Scottish ministers to repeal the bill itself and to legislate in line with the EU after exit. The bill also fails to deal properly with the reality of a clearly defined exit date or the possibility of a withdrawal period. 
These and numerous other issues in the Bill require significant attention. Presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, the correct means of ensuring that Scotland and the whole UK are prepared to leave the EU is the EU Withdrawal Bill. Yes, the Bill as introduced is unacceptable. But while some devolved powers intersect with returning EU powers, the whole UK is leaving the EU. And we need a bill that prepares the entire United Kingdom for exit while reflecting the integrity of our UK internal market. Something that the bill before us appears to have no interest in doing. The process of negotiations between the UK and Scottish governments has been longer than anyone would have hoped. But if the will is there, I am sure an agreement can be reached and powers can return from Brussels to Holyrood by the correct means. I hope this can happen within a time frame that will deem this bill irrelevant before it has even reached its final stage. But while the bill is before us, it is the, this Parliament's responsibility to address its obvious and numerous defects. Presiding officer, that is why I shall be supporting the Scottish Conservative amendments to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White, who followed by Jamie Green. Miss White, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Can I just remind um, the Conservatives there that Scotland didn't vote uh, to leave the EU or Brexit? And as we are in a day of, as we are in a day of reminding, um, I was actually reminded uh, this morning at the health committee that it's 381 days today, from today, until we exit, until Brexit comes into force. So that sent me back to thinking when I first heard about the Great Repeal Bill, etc. And uh, there's a paper there which I picked up at Westminster, and it's called the Great Repeal Bill, 23rd of February, 2017. It's not a long time ago, and now look where we are just now. And I want to remind them what it says about devolution. Legislating for Brexit will have significant implications for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. If the Great Repeal Bill transposes all directly applicable EU law, it could effectively implement a range of provisions that are within devolved competence. And therefore, as long as the Sewell Convention is respected, that basically should be OK. But we know full well that the Sewell Convention is not being respected it also goes on to say, however, the Sewell Convention in its statutory form includes the rider that the government will not normally, normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without consent. It also goes on to say, not using the Sewell Convention will bring its own political issues and raise objections in the devolved institutions. That, presiding officer and members, is why we need a legal continuity bill. That is absolutely why we need that. And I do agree with Tavish Scott, John Swinney, and John McAlpine and others have mentioned, it's absolutely essential that we have frameworks. And I do want to raise a number of these relating to health, as I'm on the health committee now. And we did take evidence this morning in regards to Brexit and health. There is a number, and I'm not going to read them all out from the paper, but there's 82 policy areas where non-legislative common frameworks may be required. These take into account blood safety and quality, clinical trials, medical products for human use, medicine prices, organ transplants, quality and safety, public health, tissues and cells, uh, quality and safety also, cross-border health care as well, huge, huge issue. And uh, for more detailed discussion, which is the 24 policy areas, reciprocal health care. I think these are really, really important issues. And whilst I'm sorry I'm not speaking to the amendments that's there, simply because I'm on the health committee, I'm not on that committee, I think it's something that we really need to keep in mind, that these are all areas which affect the general population in an absolutely, you know, a way which affects their whole lives, not just theirs, but their families also. Yeah, I'll take an intervention, Ms. Hamilton. Rachel Hamilton. Um, thank you for taking the intervention. Um, which opposition um, amendments to improve the continuity bill does the member think that the Finance Committee should accept? Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. I think if, if uh, Rachel Hamilton had listened to what I said, I said I'm not speaking to any of the amendments. I'm speaking to the issues which I'm speaking to the issues from my committee, the Health Committee. I think that's been responsible, and I'm asking people to look at these specifically on that respect. And I think if you actually look at the amount of uh, issues through health which are affected 
by this Brexit bill, then I think basically, and you can be quiet from shouting at the sidelines, I think basically, I think you'd want to look at that. I also want to raise a couple of things that were raised as well, which things are really, really important. And Professor Tompkins might like to look at this particular one, and particularly research funding, the workers that come from Europe to carry out research. Glasgow University has a, a, a fantastic research department which looks at heart research, kidney research, arthritis. The amount of money that goes into that, Horizon 2020,000, £78 billion, which we will not be able to facilitate if we are not within the EU and under Brexit. you also got the research workforce. There's 18.3%, 13.4% of academic staff. One of the largest in the UK, Scotland has the largest research workforce. What's going to happen to these people? And people this morning, when we had the evidence from professionals, they were absolutely appalled and absolutely worried that people are not actually applying for these jobs. I think if I'm serving right, it was down by 9% already that are not applying for research jobs. And their big worry was other countries, and quite rightly so, are going to pick up that slack. And where does our reputation for research go when we're no longer able to access Horizon 2020 or access any budgets coming from the EU? Now, these are things that I think should be raised and I hope will be raised during the process of the bill. I'm just raising it just now because I'm on a health committee and, and absolutely I'm, I'm worried that this is going to happen, that we will not have the research facilities that we normally have. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Mr Green, four minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I may be fairly new to this Parliament and the legislative process, but nothing about this feels right to me. We have been afforded far from adequate opportunity to scrutinise this bill. It is absolutely farcical that in just a few hours' time, this Parliament will be debating and voting on over 230 amendments. And let me tell you why that bothers me. Because this legislation was either a long time in the coming in which case, why are we rushing it through the process? Or was it instead hastily drafted with questionable legal foundation? In which case, why should hastily drafted legislation be scrutinized in an equally hastily manner? That looks and feels to me like a dangerous combination. Uh, there's no doubt that Brexit is an emotive subject and it is perfectly acceptable to have contradicting views on it. But what is not acceptable is to let our personal or partisan views on the UK government, or even Brexit itself, get in the way of our collective duty to make good law in this parliament, or undermine the highly respected and highly valued way that we pass legislation. Now, last week, uh, Joanne Lamont asked SNP members if this bill should continue, regardless of whether there was a deal or not. And one reply said, the bill is in place today in order to ensure that we get a deal. It is it has been used as nothing more than a bargaining tool, a sleight of hand in a very dangerous game of testing this Parliament's well-established methods of passing law. But we are where we are, so please, can we at the very least ensure that any bill that is passed today is watertight? And that is why these benches... Uh, I shan't. That is why these benches... That is why these benches have lodged 147 amendments. It is why I have, I have lodged 23. Now, Mr. Finlay might think that is a nuisance, but I call it scrutiny. I'd like to address some of the concerns which our amendments will seek to rectify this evening. Uh, this bill contains provisions that would give Scottish ministers power to make subjective decisions as to whether or not they think the UK government is fulfilling its obligations under international treaties. Not the courts, but Scottish ministers. It says that Scottish ministers should decide when exit day is. It says Scottish ministers have the power to cherry pick which bits of EU legislation it wants to adopt into Scots law, even after exit day. And then it gives them the power within that to decide which bits of that EU law it wants to transpose. It allows Scottish ministers to introduce counterproductive and conflicting regulations that fly in the face of sensible frameworks and that put at risk our UK internal market, Scotland's biggest market. And worst of all, as it is currently drafted, none of this, none of this will require Parliament's consent. There are so many questions, yet so little time to debate and discuss them. Our pragmatic amendments will address, I've only got a minute left, 
Our pragmatic amendments will address problems arising uh, from a number of other issues. Two parallel and potentially conflicting approaches to the adoption of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Variances in the approach to Frankovich between the two withdrawal bills. And even if Scottish public authorities are adequately equipped to deal with existing EU law, if it becomes Scots law, never mind any new ones which are transposed after Brexit. So I make an appeal to MSPs right across the chamber. Judge this bill on the content, not on the context. And I appeal, and I really do appeal to members of the Finance and Constitution Committee who will be voting on this this evening. If an amendment makes sense, regardless of who moved it, then please consider it. Because in the absence of due scrutiny in this bill, we are relying on you to uphold the integrity of this parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Can I remind members there is some small time in hand for interventions, but it's up to members, of course, whether they wish to take interventions. I call Richard Lockhead to be followed by Neil Bibby. Mr Lockhead, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you. I should start, of course, by responding to Jamie Green's uh, request at the end of his speech by saying that you simply can't divorce the content of any bill in this parliament from its context, because that goes to the heart of why the bill is here in the first place. And I recall the Leave campaign and many pledges that were made during the campaign uh, in relation to the EU referendum. We all remember the £350 million a week that was promised to the NHS if people in the UK voted Leave. Of course, it's now transpired that was barefaced nonsense. And actually, the Financial Times found that the Brexit and the impact of Brexit is actually costing the UK £350 million a week at the moment in terms of the damage to our economy. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer has just said today, I understand from social media, that we're going to be paying money into the EU post-Brexit up to 2064. So you can't divorce the context from the content of this bill we're debating today. One pledge I do not recall from the Leave campaign is that if the UK votes to leave and there's Brexit, that powers will be taken away from the Scottish Parliament. Yet here we are, in 2018, discussing the biggest threat to Scottish devolution since the Parliament was set up in 1999. Because this is an issue that's been put here in front of us to deal with, and it's the making of the UK government. That's why the bill's here just now and why we have this emergency situation we have to face. Of course, we have the irony that one of the reasons why so many people across the UK and the Conservative Party uh, supported leaving the EU is because they felt it was over-centralised and that power should be brought back to the people. Yet we have a situation that post-Brexit, they want power to be taken away from Scotland and centralised in London. And that's one thing many people in this chamber and across Scotland don't want to see happening. Now, the issue of UK frameworks is a very interesting one. Some people see UK frameworks as a way in which we can work together on issues of common interest to make sure there's no um, unintended consequences of policies adopt north, adopted north or south of the border, but it would damage both the north and south of the border. Uh, one issue might be the outbreak of animal diseases, for instance, where quite clearly we're one island that makes sense for the UK framework for dealing with animal disease outbreaks because we share the same islands. However, the reason why I think this bill is so important is that many other people, particularly the uh, mixture of people who are um, anti-devolution or grudgingly support devolution within UK ministerial ranks, um, is this, the UK framework is a smokescreen for getting power away from Scotland and getting control back from Scotland and get, get, getting control into Whitehall. Now, for nine years, I was Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment, and my experience of just about every single UK minister I dealt with, particularly in the Conservative Party, was they were either anti-devolution or grudgingly supported devolution, but would do everything within their power to push the argument as far as possible to stop Scotland taking unilateral decisions where they felt it did not coincide with the interests of the rest of the UK or where it gave Scotland a competitive advantage. So when you look at the list of reserve powers the UK want to hang on to, which is at the heart of this debate, it's for a reason. It's for a reason there's farming, fishing, uh, animal welfare, environmental standards, and so many other issues on that list that they want to reserve to the UK government. It's because the ministers looking across the UK do not want Scotland taking different decisions. But of course we have devolution, and we must not allow the UK government to undermine devolution or erode devolution. That's why this is such an important constitutional issue for the people of Scotland. Uh, briefly, yeah. Daniel Johnson. Mm. Would the member not recognise that part of the importance of devolution is not just what powers we have here, but how they are exercised? And he's right to be sceptical about the, 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 the intent of UK ministers, but surely giving uh, untrammeled uh, uh, power to Scottish ministers is not much better. 
Richard Lockhead. Before doing is giving the power to the Scottish Minister to protect devolution and the democratic will of the people of Scotland. Now, if we look at fisheries, for instance, I just want to reflect on a couple of my experiences dealing with UK ministers over the years, which I think are very, very relevant to this debate. If you look at fisheries, for instance, I had a constant battle with UK ministers who did not believe there should be any barriers put in place to stop Scottish fishermen selling Scottish fishing quota to Dutch multinationals based in England. Now, that's because the English fleet are already sold out to foreign interests, and therefore, because they believe in the free market, you make UK ministers were under pressure from their... Uh, Dutch constituent companies who happen to be based south of the border who said you must not allow the Scottish administration to put barriers in place to Scotland being able to sell its quota to interests south of the border who happen to be foreign owned. Now of course the Scottish Government with its modest powers did its best to try and put barriers in the way of that happening and there has been some success in doing that. But one of the reasons why they want fisheries re-reserved to UK government is because they want to el eliminate those barriers so that in future, Scottish ministers can't stop them doing what they want to do for their interests south of the border because the UK fishing ministers are not accountable to this parliament, they're accountable to their own constituents in the House of Commons. And I'll take you on to agriculture where I had to deal with uh, farming minister after farming minister from the Conservative government who told me, for instance, that the upland hills in Scotland and the sheep sector there and the um, less favoured areas, for instance, were very important for tourism. And I had to explain, actually, the reason why they're important is for social economic reasons and for producing food, not just for tourism. So they did not recognise the need for distinctive policies north of the border. And they don't want to have to face audiences south of the border where Scotland's got an advantage in terms of the support mechanisms we put in place to support our sectors. And they don't want that competitive advantage put in place. So there's a reason across all these powers that the UK yes, wants to yes, keep thank you. in and you must conclude. So I ask the ministers yes. not to budge an inch and no, stick to the principles to protect the Scottish Lockhead. revolution. I call Mr Bibby, Neil Bibby, uh, followed by Graeme Simpson. Mr Bibby, thank five you. minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. As we discussed at length last week, the issues arising from this bill are as much about the authority of this Parliament and its place in our democracy as the process of leaving the European Union. Scottish Labour have been clear that the UK Government's withdrawal bill is not acceptable in its current form, that we are leaving the European Union is not in dispute, but the withdrawal bill itself very much is Labour believe that it must be amended, as Neil Finlay said, and a satisfactory conclusion must be reached. Even now, we do hope that talks between the governments and the devolved administrations will result in the appropriate amendments to the withdrawal bill. But in the meantime, the Parliament must be prepared to legislate for a credible alternative, and that is why we voted for the continuity bill at stage one. As members know, there are 231 amendments here at stage two, which is a huge amount for any bill, um, never mind one that's been dealt with uh, with an emergency process. And like many others, I, I'm not happy with the truncated uh, process, which has only given us since Friday to fully consider all of those 231 uh, amendments and we have to get this legislation right I'm sure everybody ap across the chamber would believes we have to get this legislation right and I would just say to uh, members generally from other parties that there may be some amendments that I won't support at the committee at stage two but that doesn't mean that they could not be amended and we could uh, look at state amendments at stage three and I just think we need to be wary of the government acting to legislate in a haste way but we also as other members need to be and other parties need to be equally aware um, of that. Um, my uh, Labour colleagues and I will put forward a number of amendments. Many of those amendments uh, relate to the need for clarity, legal certainty and enhanced scrutiny. They, these are exceptional times and this is an exceptional bill. It places significant regulating uh, making powers in the hands of the Scottish Government. The scope of those powers and the way in which they are exercised is rightly subject to amendments, not just from Labour, but from all uh, opposition parties represented in this uh, Parliament. Uh, there are multiple instances throughout the Bill where Ministers can use regulation making powers to deal with deficiencies arriving from the UK's withdrawal uh, from the European Union to ensure there is compliance with international obligations, or in the case of Section 13, which is particularly controversial, to make provision corresponding to EU law after exit date. The Minister will recall in evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee last week that the Law Society said that Section 13 lacked clarity. Professor Alan Page warned that it could amount to a potentially major surrender by the Parliament of its legislative competence. Yeah. He called it a thoroughly bad idea, and I'll just remind the Chamber of that. Labour will therefore seek to remove uh, the power, and if not successful, with that at least put in place checks 
and balances, and we can see from the amendments um, uh, on, on specifically on that from the Liberal Democrats and the Tories, uh, other suggestions on, on how to do that. And I'd be interested to know um, the Greens' position on, 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 on Section 13 and those, and those amendments being put forward by Labour, Conservative and Liberal uh, de Democrats. We will seek to ensure that these powers uh, are proportionate and used where necessary, rather than where the Scottish Government ministers and the Scottish Government ministers alone consider them to be appropriate. The Tory government's withdrawal bill marginalises Parliament. That is a criticism that has been made of the bill by Labour, Liberal Democrat and SNP MPs, as well as many on the government's own backbenches. Witnesses to the committee have spelled out their evidence the ways in which the withdrawal bill represents a power grab. Not just grabbing power from the devolved administrations, but from Parliament itself. It would therefore be wrong for members of the Scottish Government to condemn a UK withdrawal bill for marginalising the UK Parliament while making the same mistakes and voting against proper parliamentary scrutiny in this chamber. And so I urge the Minister and other parties uh, not just to give Labour amendments this, this evening uh, their fullest consideration, but to support them. Officer, I also want to draw the Minister's attention to amendments covering the general principles of EU law, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and other rights and protections. There are a number of amendments in my name which prevent Ministers from using the powers granted by this Bill to weaken or remove EU-derived rights and protections including employment rights, equalities, health and safety, consumer standards and environmental protections. Uh, amendments from Claudia Beamish and Colin Smith uh, are also worthy of support. Uh, we also propose that EU-derived rights and protections cannot be weakened or removed by any other act of this Parliament. The European Union has been a driving force behind many of the environmental, consumer, health and safety protections that we take for granted today. Labour's amendments safeguard those protections which fall into devolved competency from dilution by the Scottish Government and any future Scottish Government. I hope the whole Chamber will recognise the importance of those amendments. Amendments which seek to enhance scrutiny, protect the environment and safeguard the rights of people of Scotland throughout the Brexit process and beyond, and amendments which seek to get the balance right between the powers held by ministers and this Parliament. Thank you very much. I call Graham Simpson to fall by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Simpson, four minutes, please. Thank you. Last week I spoke in the Chamber in the Stage 1 debate in my capacity as Convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I was limited in my remarks, of course, but no such restrictions apply today. That we are here right now, before amendments have been considered, that will be in a marathon session tonight, shows what a farce this process is. Now, as a committee convener, I'm exasperated that we've been afforded just three weeks to deal with this, but as a parliamentarian, I'm furious. This stunt, and that's what this is, has put this parliament in a very dim light. Let's be clear, the public is not in the least bit interested in this. The SNP may think they're stirring up some kind of anger through their pretend grievance. I can assure them they're not. No one outside of the Holyrood bubble is following any of this. We're really no further forward than we were last week, except that we now know, thanks to the Cabinet Office, that there really is no substantive beef. We know that claims that this is an emergency are entirely bogus. Mike Russell has a funny idea of what constitutes an emergency. He reminds me of one of those people who crop up in the regular newspaper reports of those who make inappropriate 999 calls, like the man who said his 50p coin was stuck in a washing machine at his local laundrette and wanted police to retrieve it, or the woman who wanted police to deal with a pair of noisy foxes outside her home. Inconveniences, but not emergencies. The vast majority of powers returning from Brussels will start off in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. None of the existing powers of the devolved governments will be affected in any way. That's hardly a power grab. If you want to, if you want to see a power grab, Mr Swinney, before you stand up, then just look at the planning bill. That's an SNP power grab. Just 24 out of 153 areas are still open to discussion. We may even get a deal this week. So what on earth are we doing here? And remember, for all the fuss, most of the SNP, Alex Neil accepted, don't even want these powers they're now complaining about. They want them to be held and controlled by Brussels. Let's be clear, this parliament is going to get a lot more powers on Brexit Day. You'd think the SNP would be pleased about that, 
But what they're desperate to do is stoke up grudges and grievance. Now, my colleague Jackson Carlow, not here at the moment, he's a reasonable man. He assures me that John Swinney and Mike Russell really want to do a deal with the UK government. I'm afraid their recent behaviour does not bear that out. But I do hope Mr Carlow is right and that my perception is wrong. What I do know is that those of us who've lodged amendments to this absurd bill will do our jobs of scrutiny tonight and maybe tomorrow. The DLPR committee, which I convene, will meet again on Thursday to discuss possible amendments to stage three. Uh, and in answer to Stuart McMillan, um, I do welcome uh, the amendment put forward by Neil Finlay uh, about exit day, which says that exit day should be the same day as the UK leaves the EU, a state of fact. Now, Mr. Russell doesn't have to apologize to me for the extra time we're spending as parliamentarians, but he should certainly be saying sorry to all the parliamentary staff who've been dealing with this. I hope a the deal member's is just done. concluding. I hope a deal is done and that this is dropped so we can all focus on the real issues. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Mr Stevenson, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me, through the Chair, say to Graham Simpson that from my very first speech in June 2001, I have opposed wholeheartedly, unambiguously and continuously uh, the common fisheries policy. And I'm immensely glad that we should be leaving that. And nothing in my previous 728 speeches uh, is at odds with that. Now, I just direct something to the uh, convener of the Standards Committee. Uh, why do marshalled lists at stage two not have numbers uh, against uh, the groupings they do at stage three? So I'm going to speak to uh, what would be if it was numbered uh, group 11, uh, which is exercise of powers under section 11 and 13, integration with UK government uh, policy. And uh, let me... Uh, let me just start by looking at Jamie uh, Green's amendments. Uh, that's uh, 148 and 154. Uh, Jamie uh, in his, Green, in his contribution, uh, said that we should have watertight law and we should judge our law by its content. Well, Jamie Green in both his amendments uh, refers to UK government policy, our negotiating lines of the UK government, as the basis upon which uh, his amendments are founded. Neither of these things are things that are available to me, in particular the negotiating lines. Not only that, they appear to change from week to week, day to day. So whatever merits there might have been in his amendments, uh, they certainly are not watertight law and they should be judged inadequate. But I want to turn more substantially uh, to Adam Tompkins' uh, amendments. And by the way, let me just say, I'm going to say there is an amendment from the Tories I would be prepared to accept. I'll come back to that. Keep listening. That got the Tories' attention for a brief second. No. No, he won't. Not from that source. The, the key point about uh, Adam Tonkin's amendments 150 uh, and 151 et al is to take back powers which we currently exercise over agriculture, environmental protection, and in particular, uh, fisheries. Because no regulations may be made under subsection one unless the consent of a Minister of the Crown is provided. I do. Adam Tompkin. But, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the member for giving way. Will the member not accept that there is no such thing as taking any of these powers away from this parliament, given that this parliament cannot currently exercise powers in any of these domains because they are subject to EU law and we may not exercise powers contrary to EU law. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm afraid uh, Mr Tompkins is clearly not much engaged in the fishing debate. In fishing, we make our own regulations which differ from regulations, for example, in requiring landing of species that were not caught on quota. They are different from the rest of the UK. They are different from what occurs elsewhere in the EU. They do form part of a framework, and we support frameworks. That's without doubt. 
So, and the same would be true in environmental protection and agriculture. There are clear differences in agriculture where 85% of our area that is under agriculture is less favoured area. In the south of the border, it is 15%. Therefore, there are entirely different requirements which lead to different uh, legislative uh, solutions uh, that you definitely have to have. Now, let me talk about the amendment I could accept were I in the government. And that is Amendment 122, uh, which says a Minister of the Crown may not without cons withhold consent, etc., etc., where a common framework has been agreed. Now, that's fine. That's okay. But it is a simplex amendment where we need a duplex solution. In other words, I would accept that amendment if the UK withdrawal bill had exactly the same provision in relation to UK ministers' inability to act without the consent of the devolved administrations. So it is possible to accept uh, a motion, uh, an amendment from Adam Tompkins from the Tories, uh, but it would be, have to be utterly conditional. We have joint decision-making. As a minister, I had joint decision-making across the border on canals, and again, on my appointments to the Climate Change Committee, where all administrations had to agree. So we've got, and those are only some examples. Uh, so, presiding officer, we know that the governments in these islands can work together effectively. Where fishing is concerned, uh, we've got to get a solution that moves us away from 60% of the fish caught in our waters being caught by foreign vessels without legal oversight from Scottish jurisdiction. We've got to get that changed. And nothing that the UK government could do, will do, have threatened to do, that would take powers and the right to catch fish in our waters away from Scottish fishermen will have my support. Not now, not in the past, not ever. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Kerr, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And at the outset, let me just for completeness declare an interest. Firstly, as a lawyer, but also as a lawyer with a pathological dislike and intolerance for excessive legalese, ambiguity and imprecision. Throughout a legal career which began nearly two decades ago, it has often vexed me at how often law firms I worked for were being paged large amounts of money to clear up ambiguity in legislation because the legislature has been insufficiently certain or clear in its drafting. It is perhaps apposite to note in passing that a significant amount of that was legislation generated in the first instance by Europe. In particular, where a directive such as the Acquired Rights Directive that begat Tupi, or perhaps the Working Time Directive have been left open to interpretation or insufficiently dealt with an area, the sheer volume of case law generated in the courts has been a staple source of income for law firms, whilst leaving some waiting years for resolution or redress. And it's in that context that last Wednesday evening, I took the draft continuity bill, the explanatory notes, the financial memorandum, the delegated powers memorandum, the policy memorandum, and the presiding officer's statement on legislative competence to the Star Bank Inn at New Haven, where I looked forward to assisting the government in ensuring that this bill is as tight as it can be. And that's important. Like my colleagues, I may not agree that this bill should be enacted. I don't agree that it should be treated as emergency legislation. Actually, I don't even agree that it should have been drafted in the first place, given the likely motivations that Graham Simpson and others are suggesting. But Parliament disagrees, and it's therefore incumbent upon us all to ensure it is the best it can be, unambiguous, uncontestable, unchallengeable. Three hours later, the Star Bank politely asked me to leave at closing time. I had over 50 amendments ready to lodge the next day to improve this bill. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm not a draftsman. I am a litigator. I have never before drafted a bill, nor even considered amending one. Yet here I was, armed with only an ethos of reducing ambiguity and providing effective scrutiny, proposing over 50 amendments, including things as basic as clarifying the meaning of the exit date, as obvious as removing the word prospective next to withdrawal from the European Union in section one, as fundamental as replacing whether a law is, quote, passed or made with the legally precise enacted. Now this I find deeply concerning and Parliament too should be concerned. This may be uncharted territory, but there is no excuse for a legislature to produce 
bad law, which is what we risk doing if this parliament produces an act which may not be competent, is ambiguous, and is easily challenged in the courts. The fact that between all the parties in Holyrood, there have been introduced more than 200 amendments only serves to demonstrate how flawed it is. Court challenge is inevitable. And perhaps above all, Deputy Presiding Officer, the standing of this Parliament, the respect it is accorded as a mature, competent legislative body, risks being diminished. Not in my last minute. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. As has been clearly demonstrated by the 232 amendments proposed and the debate this afternoon, there is a very real prospect that this legislation, this process, will act against the aim of making this respected, competent and robust. We only have to look at other legislation which the government introduced with the best of intentions but now admits is rushed and not robust, such as offensive behaviour at football or the name person legislation. So no, Mr Finlay, it's not a game. I do not giggle in my pyjamas as I deploy nearly two decades of training and experience to try to get this right. I take it very seriously indeed. Mr Finlay's point about the lack of amendment from the SNP backbenchers is valid, but if he is incapable of providing effective scrutiny, he should avoid trying to mock those of us who can. And therefore, Deputy Presiding Officer, whilst I maintain the best thing that could happen is for the SNP to dump this bill now and get back to the negotiating table to secure a Brexit deal that delivers for us all, I accept they don't want to lose face. But let's take a step back and do this properly, taking time to get it right. Thank you. Daniel Johnson, followed by Christina McKelvey. Five minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to speak to four specific amendments. Before I do, I'd like to also talk about uh, and reflect on the debate that we've had both this afternoon and, indeed, when the bill was introduced. Because much has been talked about devolution, many speakers from right across this chamber have spoken about the importance and principles of devolution. People have talked in glowing and hallowed terms about Donald Trump and their right to do so. Much of what we value in this place is thanks to him. The Scotland Act, with its ingenious uh, construction around reserved and devolved items, but more importantly, something in Donald Dewar's character, his earnest and thoughtful approach to politics. I think this Scot Scottish Parliament has much to thank, both his character as much as his wisdom in terms of the way that we do things today. Because above all else, and the reason that I raise this is because I think devolution is more than just simply what powers this Parliament has to exercise. It is about the way in which we exercise those powers. And if we look at the structures that we have in this place, I think that's clear, whether it's from our committees, which seek to be consensual, or indeed with the Parliamentary Bureau, which decides uh, parliamentary business in a hopefully consensual matter, rather than simply the party of the government. I think we see those principles, those ideals, borne out. But above all else, this Parliament must, and indeed all Parliaments must, seek to constrain and challenge the power of the government. We must scrutinise, we must engage the people affected by uh, legislation, and we must come together and make decisions in this place. That's the hallmark of this Scottish Parliament, but I also believe it's what is at risk from this bill. Because if there is one deep irony, it's this. Much of the criticism placed at the, the, the feet of the withdrawal bill in the UK Parliament is that it is a ministerial power grab. And can I say politely this to Mr Russell, that simply putting sunset clauses in the similar powers that are placed within the uh, uh, continuation bill is simply insufficient to deal with those dangers and in, in terms of constraining that power grab. But to the particular amendments, firstly, can I just say that I support the amendment in Neil Finlay's name, Amendment 35, which seeks to remove Section 13 in its entirety, because this uh, section is, I think, the one which causes the most worry in terms of that scope of power, giving ministers the ability to legislate, to bring forward SSIs, uh, to, to legislate on the vast scope of EU law simply, I think, needs greater scrutiny and control than is provided for in this bill. But should that amendment fail, I would like to uh, argue for amendments 28 and 30 because they constrain those powers by limiting the time period that they can be exercised from, from five years down to two. Now, I have no doubt that there are, will be need to uh, amend legislation, make adjustment, but if that time of two years is insufficient, I am sure parliamentary time can be found, but to have five years and for allow, to allow ministers to roll on those powers for further five-year periods at their discretion, I think is simply undemocratic and is simply unnecessary. 
But can I also speak to amendments 37 and 39? Because I do not believe, given the sheer scope of European law and the implications that have, it is good enough to bring forward SSIs which will legislate in those areas through the negative procedure. We must use the affirmative procedure so that those proposals are properly looked at by committee and those proposals are brought forward into this chamber so that we can all decide whether we agree with them rather than essentially do it by default, uh, waiting for the time to click on that would happen under the negative procedure. Can I also commend uh, uh, amendments 11 through 15, 17 and 23 that Liberal Democrats, because I think they, they seek to do much of the same as, my, as those uh, amendments make. And indeed, um, I think uh, 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 amendment 41, seeking to place limits uh, on uh, negative procedure and using the affirmative procedure throughout section 13 is also uh, worthy of uh, commendation. And I notice my time is up, so I'll conclude there. It is important how we uh, do our business in this place, not just what powers we have. And I would ask members to consider that when they think about these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Christina McKelvey, followed by Dean Lockhart. Five uh, minutes, please, Ms. McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the need for the continuity bill is pretty much unquestionable to me because there are many areas around EU directives and laws which are incorporated into primary legislation that bother me greatly. And these are child sexual exploitation, trafficking in human beings, domestic violence, sexual violence, child grooming and pornography, all of which, in my opinion, go further on protections in Scots law than they do in their UK equivalents. And that bothers me greatly. The Victims' Rights Scotland Act 2015 is another such example. They go further in Scots law on protections of people than UK law. The Continuity Bill, for me, enshrines into Scots law the Charter of Fundamental Rights, of which we've heard much about today. And my reading of Adam Tompkins' Amendment 98 seeks to give no strength to the Charter in Scots law, or even a position. And that worries me greatly. I'm going to get on to that point. I'm going to get on to the point. In Stonewall's briefing to the House of Lords on amendments to the Withdrawal Bill, that the Stonewall briefing tells us, and I'm going to quote from their briefing, retaining the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Clause 5.4 of the bill makes it clear that on leaving the EU, the Charter of Fundamental Rights will no longer apply. While domestic law and the European Convention on Human Rights provide similar rights, the Charter offers an added layer of protection. Stonewall tells us that they are deeply concerned that removal of the Charter will result in the, the dilution of rights and strongly urges peers to support amendments to retain. Amendments the opposite from Adam Tompkins. Yes? Adam Tompkins. To the member for uh, giving way. Uh, for the record, presenting officer, my amendment on the Charter of Fundamental Rights reads as follows. The Charter of Fundamental Rights continues to have the same legal authority in Scots law on and after exit day as it had on the day before exit day. It is an amendment designed to provide continuity, not change, in the legal status of the Charter in Scots law. Christina yeah. McKelvey. Always in points of law, there's an interpretation. My interpretation is that you, don't, you give no force in Scots law to the Charter of Fundamental Rights via your amendment. And that will be up to the Finance and Constitution Committee to decide that later. But I would urge them to take the lead from the Stonewall briefing and to reject Amendment 98 on the same grounds that they urge the Lords to protect the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the EU withdrawal bill of the UK. Now we know that the power grab that we feared in Scotland is coming true. It's been all omitted by the UK government. It was published a list of 24 devolved pol policy areas it wants to keep control of after Brexit. We know the power grab is now officially real. They've not got an answer for it. But the UK government has never been that good at following its own advice, which is why we need to work things out for ourselves. There's a memo going around the Cabinet, I understand, that recognises that there is no argument against the claims of a power grab on Scotland's devolved powers. They've got no argument whatsoever. So that's why we need the continuity bill in Scotland. And the continuity bill comes into effect if the Scottish Parliament decides not to consent to the EU withdrawal bill. We have tried and tried and try to work with the UK government and UK-wide legislation, but they won't have it. They keep letting us down. Promises made, vows made are not delivered. So where should we go after that? We have no trust. It is within the competence of our parliament as legal experts, including the Lord Advocate of this land, have concluded. And it is the only way in which we can avoid that power grab. It is our protection against our devolved powers being withdrawn. 
When Britain leaves the EU, there are 111 powers and responsibilities in devolved areas due to be repatriated. The UK Government, in Clause 11 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, called for all of those powers to go straight to Whitehall, for ministers to decide what should be given to MSPs and what should be kept in national frameworks. Crumbs off the dinner table. That cannot be allowed to happen. And if the intention is to retain these powers only temporarily to bring it back to the Scottish Parliament, then why on earth is there not a sunset clause in the EU withdrawal bill in order to say that, to bring those powers back to Scotland, even if they want to hold on to them on a temporary basis? They've not done that. And I would urge uh, Conservative colleagues here to urge their people in Westminster to, to make sure that protection is in place. And though we have some agreement between governments on around 86 powers, there is still no consensus on the remaining 24. These are important powers, such as agriculture we've heard about, GM crops, fishing, environmental policy, public procurement, state aid, food standards, animal health and welfare, food standards, hygiene law, food labelling and chemical regulation. And if Graeme Simpson thinks that ordinary people out there are not interested in us, he should have been in this chamber on Saturday when we had the Women's Convention, International Women's Day, and listened to the questions of all of the women who asked me about the impact of the EU withdrawal bill. You should have been here that day. The UK government believes that 24 should operate on a UK-wide basis and the Scottish government being consulted on changes. The UK withdrawal bill suggests that they have a duty to consult, not a duty to get consent. So, again, where are we getting this agreement? Because we are not getting that agreement. And the UK Bill Amendments in Clause 11, as I say, do not give respect to this Parliament. It says consult. It doesn't say agree. And that is a key factor for me, because if we do not get an agreement, then what should this place do? This place has a duty to protect what it has, protect its powers, and protect the people of Scotland. And I would ask all the people on those benches over there to do that That's the two as well. Dean Lockhart, followed by Claire Adamson. Four minutes, please, Mr Lockhart. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this draft legislation is complex, far-reaching, and a number of genuine concerns have rightly been raised during today's debate. I would like to address three of those concerns in my short contribution. First, on the new powers coming to this Parliament after Brexit, it's important to remember the two very different proposals which have been put forward by the SNP and the UK Government. The SNP's differentiated approach to Brexit mentioned during the debate would mean that powers over Scottish agriculture, fisheries and a host of trade laws would remain in Brussels. The power to introduce new laws would also stay with Brussels without any need to consult or seek the consent of this Parliament. In contrast, the UK Government's EU withdrawal bill will see substantial new powers being transferred to this Parliament. Over 100 new powers either devolved immediately after Brexit or devolved once a UK-wide framework is agreed. I, I won't take an intervention. If I had, I usually would, but given the time available with this, le this uh, legislation, I don't have the time. This is where we see the direct contradiction, contradiction between the SNP's differentiated approach and this draft legislation and talk of a power grab. On the one hand, the SNP's differentiated approach would see no powers coming to this parliament, no right of consultation or consent required for future laws imposed by Brussels. But now, the SNP is complaining about a power grab over those very same powers. And by virtue of this legislation, the SNP is now demanding these very same powers are immediately transferred to this Parliament, even if doing so would damage Scotland's trade with the UK common market. This is yet another example of the SNP prioritising the EU single market at the expense of our domestic UK market, which is worth four times more to Scotland's economy. Presiding officer, turning to the provisions of the bill itself, there is clear consensus that this draft legislation is overreaching, defective, and if passed, would damage the integrity and certainty of Scots law. A number of these concerns have been expressed by experts, including the Law Society of Scotland, and they have con raised concerns that this bill introduces new categories of law not recognised by Scottish courts. These concerns apply to a number of sections of the legislation, including sections 5, 6 and 9, on which I have submitted and my colleagues have submitted amendments. The real concern, presiding officer, is that this legislation and the new categories of law being introduced will not just impact directly on the new powers coming to Scotland after Brexit, but will result in confusion over the operation of existing laws across Scotland, existing laws across the UK, resulting in years of uncertainty that will damage trade across the UK common market. 
And the third concern I would like to raise is one shared across the Chamber, with expert responses to the legislation raising more questions than answers it's now clear this Parliament will be unable to properly scrutinise this legislation. Later this evening, and possibly tomorrow morning, the Finance and Constitution Committee will meet to consider over 230 amend amendments to the bill. Even if the committee meeting is uh, extended into tomorrow, this time frame provides less than two minutes for members of this Parliament to propose, consider, debate, and vote on each amendment. Less than two, two minutes per amendment. No one can describe that as proper parliamentary scrutiny. <laughs> Presiding officer, my uh, time is uh, short, so let me conclude by highlighting that this legislation is not fit for purpose. It will damage Scotland's long-standing and very well-deserved reputation for legal certainty, and it will damage trade within our UK domestic market. The last two speakers in the open debate are Claire Adamson, followed by Ross Greer. Five minutes, please, Ms Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by thanking my colleagues across the Chamber for their contributions in the Chamber and in the various committees who have already contributed to the process which brings us here today. I particularly would like to thank the convener and members of the Finance and Constitution Committee for the interim report, um, one that was conducted um, uh, which was about the Parliament and the principles underlying the devolution settlement. And today, we are all responsible for the protecting the devolution of this Parliament. In the report, they say, quote, in the view of the Finance and Constitution Committee, the Un European Union withdrawal bill represents a fundamental challenge to this institution and the devolution settlement. It is imperative that the UK government takes urgent action to ensure that the bill respects the devolution settlement only then would the Finance and Constitution Committee be able to recommend legislative consent. It couldn't be clearer from our colleagues on the Finance and Constitution Committee. And that's why this bill is needed today, and it is far from being a stunt. It's absolutely required to ensure the future of this place. I have a real issue with the position that the Tories have taken with regarding this, especially when you consider some of the things they have already said in this place about powers. Adam Tonkin said on leaving the European Union, it means among other things that this parliament will get even stronger. Already one of the most powerful devolved legislatures in the world. One of the most powerful devolved legislatures in the world seems pretty hollow rhetoric when he's content that the UK government has shown such contempt for this place and its handling of the EU withdrawal bill that we find ourselves having to put through emergency legislation. Absolutely. I've listened to many contributions over the years from the Tory benches about centralisation. Indeed, again, I'm sorry to pick on Mr Tompkins, but in the 3rd of November in 2016, he said, it's well documented that Scotland is now one of the most centralised countries in Europe. Just yesterday, the Scottish, Scottish Local Government Partnership criticised the Scottish Government, not the United Kingdom Government, for strangling local democracy, castigated it for bo bossing local authorities around and controlling everything from the centre. Mr Tompkins, if it's not right for local government, how can it possibly be right for the devolved legislatures of this country to be bossed about and controlled by Westminster? The continuity bill has been described as a wrecking bill, but far from this, it's designed to, to protect this parliament and the devolution settlement. Now, today we've heard um, contributions about how this should be, particularly about the amendments. And uh, as a member who's not been involved in the committee scrutinising this um, and, in, and not involved in the, the debate that will happen in the um, committee this afternoon, the stage two process, um, it, it's difficult for me to, to take this away from the principles because it is about principles and we've heard that from many contributions this afternoon from Claudia Beamish, from Mark Ruskell, talking about the principles that are in danger, the things we are set to lose if we don't have this bill in place should it be necessary. And John McAlpine also said that much has changed since we started discussing this. Well, for me, one of the biggest things that changed was the announcement from the, budget, the Office for Budget Responsibility this afternoon that said we could be paying the Brexit bill until 2064, that it could cost £37.1 billion. 
and that in every one of those years we'll be paying out more than we recruit from the Brexit process. So in such uncertain times, with everything that Brexit threatens, what we have to do today is make sure that we progress this bill, that the bill is scrutinised, that this legislation is in place to protect the devolved settlement of this Parliament. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is three minutes from Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I um, only have a few minutes, so apologies if this is a bit rushed. Um, it's obviously vital that we get the continuity bill right. The task at hand is unprecedented, both in terms of the scale of changes to retained EU law to make it workable and the powers being granted to ministers to make these changes. We must get the balance right to provide proper democratic oversight while allowing ministers to make the changes necessary and in a timely manner. I sincerely hope that the government is open to the changes that I'm proposing and those of all other parties. I can see amendments from all other opposition parties that the Greens are certainly interested in hearing more from and some that we will absolutely support. I'm afraid I've just not got enough time, but I will engage Mr Finlay on this this evening. Uh, we've seen the UK government ignore the opposition at Westminster, the devolved governments, parliament and assemblies. This has created an entirely avoidable mess. We can do better, but we obviously have little time to do so. The Minister made very welcome comments on the issue of appropriate parliamentary oversight and scrutiny when I raised concerns with the UK Bill in September of last year. He made a commitment that the Scottish Government have, and I'll quote, no desire to exercise powers without proper scrutiny and that they will work right across the Chamber and with the committees to make sure that there is proper scrutiny. I've tabled several, uh, several amendments to improve parliamentary oversight, two of which are particularly important. The first is to section 14 of the Bill. These are its primary scrutiny mechanisms. The bill currently sets out a list of what changes should be made by affirmative procedures and by the super affirmative procedure. Everything else is left to the negative procedure. This current approach is potentially dangerous. It's extremely difficult to predict what changes will be needed, so a definitive list for the affirmative procedures and leaving everything else to the negative risks some major changes being made without proper scrutiny. Equally, making everything subject to the affirmative risk overwhelming the parliament and delaying necessary and small scale changes. My amendment would address this. It takes inspiration from an amendment at Westminster which creates a sifting committee. This was introduced by the Conservative Chair of the Procedures Committee in the Commons. The amendment would give the Parliament's committees here the power to decide upon appropriate scrutiny mechanisms, whether it is negative, affirmative or super affirmative. The current list in the bill would continue to act as a guide, but the decision on scrutiny would ultimately lie with Parliament. The second amendment is to section 31 on the urgency provisions. Again, I recognise the need to make an urgent change immediately should the situation arise, but this is a power that is open to abuse, permitting ministers to simply decide that a matter is urgent and make a change before Parliament has the chance to even look at it. My amendment would provide Parliament with the power to suspend these urgency provisions if it believes they've been misused, an emergency break. Parliament would also have the power to reinstate them, of course, if it believed the problem of misuse has been resolved. These two changes would fundamentally alter the balance of power in the bill and ensure that it is the majority in this parliament, not a minority government, which has control. I should be clear that these amendments are not made in the ardent belief that the current Scottish Government would otherwise abuse its powers, but as a parliament we would be failing our own institution, as well as those it represents, if we did not do all we could to ensure that the primacy of this elected body of the majority is established. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches. Um, a bit disappointing that not everyone who took part is in the chamber. Uh, we'll go to James Kelly. Five minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I think in some cases it's been a challenging debate this afternoon for, for members. Obviously, in relation to stage two, we have 231 amendments that the Finance and Constitution Committee will be considering uh, later on this evening and potentially into to, tomorrow morning. Um, and it, it's been a challenge for members, I think, to pull out what are the main themes um, from those amendments. And I think that emphasises some of the concerns that have been raised about the process uh, from Tavi Scott, from Joanne Lamont in, in the beginning in a, a point of order and also uh, from Graham Sim Simpson. Uh, I mean, I, I note and accept the fact that the Parliament accepted that this is emergency legislation, but the reality is we are proceeding through this at breakneck speed. A lot of it is complex. Um, it takes, you know, some time to, to grasp the detail of some of these issues. 
and it's going to be a real challenge for the Finance and Constitution Committee to meet tonight to, to, you know, to, to deal with this issue. And I think there, there is an element of frustration from MSPs across the chamber that you know, we're not able to properly do such important legislation justice. I think the other thing that has come out in the debate is, and, you know, Neil Finlay, uh, you know, highlighted this as, to an extent, how we have been used as part uh, of the negotiating game that's going on between the, the Scottish governments and the UK governments. And I, you saw that in the, the, the interchange that took place between Adam Tompkins uh, Mr. Swinney and Mike Russell. In fact, at one point, Mr. Swinney and Mr. Russell were both trying to intervene in Adam Tompkins. And the, 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 the kind of important point of debate was the, the motion that had, or the amendment that had been submitted to the House of Lords. And that's clearly a, an important area in terms of the negotiations. I understand that. Uh, but it shows you how, how Parliament uh, is sitting in the middle of that game. I mean, the probably the most important event that's going to. Yes, yeah, sure. John Swinney. I, I, I asked Mr. Mr. Kelly has just described the exchanges between Mr. Tompkins and Mr. Russell and I as a game. This is not a game because it's about what is the ability of this parliament to exercise powers. When it was established, it was envisaged we would be able to exercise. And the crucial question is about whether or not the agreement of this parliament or this government will be sought in any of the frameworks that are envisaged in the United Kingdom uh, arrangements, over which we have no issue but frameworks. But whether our agreement is sought is a fundamental issue that I think anyone that respects devolution would have mind to accept. I wonder if Mr Kelly agrees with that position. James Kelly. The, the, the key point, Mr Swinney, is how we resolve this issue. And even if Parliament um, processes, proceeds and passes this legislation, which is there's a danger it could end up in the courts, uh, the key point is how to resolve it, and you resolve it around the negotiating table. And what I was going on to say was the most important uh, event of the week is probably uh, tomorrow's meeting where the First Minister uh, is attending, and I understand there's going to be a conversation with the Prime Minister. I think we would all hope that there's some progress there so that we can get uh, a resolution, because I think the process we're going through in terms of this uh, legislation, although it's necessary to protect the devolution settlement, uh, I don't think it's been Parliament's fine, uh, finest hour. I think there have been some important contributions made uh, in relation to uh, uh, amendments. Uh, Claudia Beamish spoke very passionately about the importance to protect the current elements of EU law in relation to the environment, and she was right to highlight the fact that we didn't want to see uh, a race to the bottom. Uh, I think there are real concerns about the provisions of Section uh, 13, and there's a feeling that the government have gone too far in trying to establish powers, uh, additional powers for ministers. And Neil Bibby uh, and Daniel Johnson uh, highlighted those very well. I thought Mark Ruskell made an excellent speech in supporting the principle of animal sentience, and I know that uh, Colin Smith uh, is, uh, it has got amendments in that area also. Uh, I'll be intrigued uh, later on to see uh, the government's uh, defence for the abandoning the Frankovich uh, principle. I know that that's something that Tavi Scott has got Amendment 7 on later. It's an important principle of EU law and that allows compensation for workers in relation to insolvencies. And I wonder why the Scottish government uh, has you know, sought to, to take that out. In relation to, in relation to exit day, well, that, well look, at, look at Mr. Scott's amendment, you know, that would seem to pinpoint. We'll explore it later, Mr. Russell. Um, in terms of exit day, I welcome the fact that there is going to be some clarity around that because it's important, whatever your view on this argument, that we're clear when exit day is. And summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I think it's absolutely uh, essential that you know, we try and get a resolution to this process going forward. I hope there can be continue to be constructive discussions between the Scottish and UK governments, because if, if we end up in a situation where the, this legislation proceeds and pass, there's a danger it could end up in the courts and be challenged, and that's not something that, that any of the parliamentarians would want. 
call Martin Fraser. Around six minutes, please, Mr. Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. We've had some powerful speeches in this debate right across the chamber, but for a stage two debate, disappointingly few members, I thought, actually referred to uh, amendments that were being proposed or tried to argue for them. What I'd like to do is, if I have time, make reference to a number of the key amendments uh, that are before us this evening. But before I do that, I want to set this all briefly in context. As we heard from Adam Tompkins and other Conservative speakers during this debate, our view is that this bill is unnecessary, it's poorly drafted, and it's probably illegal. It is simply an exercise in grandstanding by the SNP government and will do nothing to improve the legal framework in Scotland as we prepare for Brexit. And that's not just the view of the Scottish Conservatives. Giving evidence to this Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee last week, Professor Alan Page of Dundee University said, I have considerable doubts over whether the bill as introduced does constitute an effective solution to the challenge the Scottish Parliament will face. And we also heard evidence from the Law Society of Scotland on the bill, indicating that there are a huge number of issues with the original draft that require to be addressed before it will make good law. Now, we heard SNP speaker after speaker in this debate saying that the devolution settlement must be respected. And I think there's a rich irony in these demands when you look at the way the SNP government are approaching this legislation. Firstly, we know the presiding officer of this parliament has ruled that this bill is beyond the Scottish Parliament's powers and it is not competent for this parliament to pass it. And yet that opinion has been ignored by the Scottish Government, the same party who continually demand that others respect the devolution settlement. Secondly, this is a bill being rushed through Parliament as emergency legislation, despite the fact that there is no emergency. There is no requirement to have this bill on the statute book within a matter of weeks when we are not due to leave the EU for another year. Indeed, by rushing through uh, this bill, while the EU withdrawal bill is still subject to change at Westminster, we may find that the provisions passed in haste by this Parliament in this bill actually end up being incompatible with what is in the EU withdrawal bill, which may be subsequently changed, meaning it has to come back to this Parliament for future amendment. Yep. And then we heard a number of points from Joanne Lamont, Tavish Scott, uh, Jamie Green and others about the time provided for parliamentary scrutiny. There are some 231 amendments lodged to this bill, all having to be considered in a very short space of time by members of the Finance and Constitution Committee. And notwithstanding the greatest respect I have for all my colleagues on that committee, that is no way to be treating a serious piece of legislation. And those of us who are used to, those of us who are used to uh, stage two and stage three debates in this chamber will know that amendments, when amendments are published, very often external bodies will engage with us, the constituents will write to us and, and make a case to argue for or against particular amendments. The opportunity for that to be done in this vitally important piece of legislation has been lost because of the very short timescale on which it is being forced through. Now, whatever reservations the Scottish Conservatives may have about this bill, and there are many, we are not in the business of seeing this Parliament pass bad laws. And that is why we have put down 147 amendments to this bill. And I'd say to Mr Finlay, in response to his tantrum earlier on in the debate, this is not about playing games, Mr Finlay. We are in the serious business in this Parliament of passing laws. That is why we are sent here by our constituents, and that is what we are paid to do. And Mr Finlay, if Mr Finlay doesn't want to be in the business of passing laws, perhaps he needs to reconsider his career choices. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, Mr Finlay is Labour's Brexit spokesman. He is supposed to be providing front bench opposition from that position. What have Labour done on this bill under his guidance? They voted with the SNP for this to be emergency yep. legislation. Yep. They okay. voted for a timetabling motion to curtail debate, and they voted for this bill at stage one. If that's providing opposition, Mr Finlay, I'm a Dutchman. <laughs> I'll give way. Neil Finlay. Well, can I ask the Dutchman then, uh, can, I, can I ask him, uh, if his party had delivered on the promises they gave to the UK Parliament and to this Parliament, then we wouldn't be in this position in the first place. It's your fault we're in this position, Mr Fraser. Martin Martin Fraser. Fraser. Mr Finlay well knows there has been an amendment lodged yeah. to the EU withdrawal yeah. bill at Westminster, but Mr Finlay's view of opposition is to keep supporting everything the SNP frontbench does, that he needs some lessons in how to deliver opposition. Yeah. Now, presiding officer. 
Briefly, I want to touch just on a number of amendments. Am amendment 59 in my name seeks to put a declaration on the face of the bill that any decisions made by the Supreme Court, that all or any provisions of this Act are out with the legislative competence of this Parliament must be complied with. I think that's important given the strong possibility of the Supreme Court ruling on the validity of this Act. I've got a number of amendments down, as indeed others like uh, Tavish Scott and James Kelly do, to Section 13, which contains extensive powers to Scottish Ministers to continue to make regulations under this Bill for a period of up to 15 years after the date of exiting the EU. That cannot be acceptable, and I look forward to hearing in the debate later how that can be reduced. But in closing, I just want to make one more uh, point, which I think is important. It was made in this debate by both Graham Simpson and Dean Lockhart. Because in relation to all these powers in question, all the powers in dispute between the UK government and the Scottish government, the SNP actually want to see every last one of these powers retained in Brussels and not devolved at all. Indeed, if the SNP had their way, we would be re-entering the EU and every single one of these powers they are complaining about would be returned in their no entirety time, to the EU and not exercised any closer to home. It is a UK Conservative government delivering a powers bonanza to this Parliament yeah. under devolution. Powers which every single SNP member of this Parliament, with the honourable exception of Alec Neil, wants to return to Brussels at the first opportunity. And in so doing, they are airbrushing from history the 38% of the population who actually voted for Brexit. Over one million Scots, more than a third Come of current close, SNP please. voters, they are saying to them, we'll send those powers back to Brussels. That's what the SNP would do. Residing officer, this whole bill must is at best peace. a waste of parliamentary time. It should be rejected by this parliament. But in the meantime, we will do what we can to try and improve it. I call Michael Russell. Would you take us up to five o'clock, please, Cabinet With Secretary. pleasure, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start uh, where I finished off last week in the Stage 1 debate, just by cautioning the Chamber, and particularly in the light of what we've just heard, to try and use language in a way that helps this debate and not hinders it. Uh, you can't use the words, you can't use the words forced through to describe a parliamentary process which has been taken place by debate with majorities on each occasion. I know that that's not a popular thing for the Conservatives, but that's true. Let me also welcome just one or two of the things that have been said by a number of people and indicate what I indicated at the beginning of this debate. We are listening very carefully to, to concerns that exist, for example, as Ross Greer has given on the sifting power. And I, I entirely agree with Ross Greer that this is a question of balancing the requirements of this bill, which we did not wish, which we don't wish to be involved in this Brexit process, balancing the urgent requirements of that with the maximum amount of parliamentary scrutiny. That is how I am going to approach all the amendments on this matter this evening, and I hope we can have that debate and either resolve it this evening or create the circumstances in which we will resolve it when we come to stage three. Uh, and that is what we will endeavour to do, and I say that's how I'm going into this evening, that is how I'm going into this evening, no matter the provocations. But let me also, let, of course, of course, of course. Neil Finlay. You know, from what he says, I presume he's um, moving towards setting up that sifting committee. I wonder if, like me, you would welcome Mr Greer's bouncing enthusiasm to sit in that sifting committee, should it be set up? Michael Russell. I'm, uh, I'm always welcome bouncing enthusiasm wherever I, I see it. I, I used to be, have bouncing enthusiasm myself. It seems a long time ago, but that's what I used to have. But, you know, there are ways to take this. Away. Well, Mr Finley does not believe me, but then he has not known me as long as some other people in this chamber. Um, the reality is that there may be other ways to do this. There may be ways to do it that uh, expedite it more closely. But I am I'm in agreement that we should endeavour to have that maximum scrutiny and let's try and find a, a way to do so. Um, I, I would also want to recall something that Sandra White said in this debate, which is that there are 381 days till exit day. And even if there is a transition period, there's only likely to be less than two years beyond that. So there will be an urgency in getting these issues resolved. And we have to balance that urgency with the issues of scrutiny, and we will endeavour to do so. I'm sure the whole chamber will endeavour to do so. But that 381 days, presiding officer, should concentrate our minds in the chaos and confusion of Brexit, which is being driven forward by the Conservatives. It is a black hole absorbing energy and money. We know from the Chancellor's statement this afternoon that growth is collapsing. 
We know from the figures that the UK government has produced that economic decline beckons us. And in fact, the Tories know that to be true. There are very few original Brexiteers in those benches. We heard from Mr. Simpson, who was one of them, whose views have not changed. But there are others who have been dragged in this position. And I would ask them, I would ask them just to pause for a second. Consider what's in the interests of Scotland, not what's in the interests of the Conservative Party. Because Scotland's democratic will was shown in the referendum and continues to be shown. Scotland does not want to be dragged out of Europe against its will. And therefore, the position that we've seen the Conservatives in this afternoon of endeavouring to ensure that the Tory interest in this comes before Scotland's interest, we should question. And we should question it this evening when we consider each of the amendments and we should go on questioning it. And at the heart of that is an issue that uh, Mr Tompkins... No, I'm sorry, I really have to make pro progress here. I shall mention you in a moment, Mr Green, don't worry. Um, uh, there is... Uh, I have not forgotten your contribution. Uh, I wish I could. The, Mr. Tompkins, Mr. Tompkins made a very key point. He talked about ag agreed, not imposed. And that's why he was subject to the spectacle of Mr. Uh, Swinney and I showing bouncing enthusiasm for intervening on him. And it is a key issue. Because if his view had been taken on board by the UK government, there would be no problem. We would not be having this. But it has not been taken aboard. It was not taken aboard in the original uh, drafting of, of the bill, and it has not been taken aboard in the revised or replaced clause. And that is the issue. Agreed, not imposed. Mr. Tompkins said it himself. Agreed, not imposed. And until the UK government get to that position, there can be no agreement. Mr. Finlay chided me about getting round the table and getting an agreement. Now, around that table is not just the Scottish Government, the UK Government, but the Welsh Government as well. And I know his colleague, uh, Professor Drakeford, with whom I've worked very closely in the last year, and I will go around that table at any time with any request that comes from the UK Government in order to resolve this. We have been doing that. But we have been, as one on the issue, agreed, not imposed. And that is where we remain, with the unity, I have to say, of all the parties in this chamber, and the unity of all the parties in the Welsh Parliament until, until we got to the stage of no return, where there had to be some movement on this. Otherwise, we would simply have been steamrolled. But we st are still in the position, we are absolutely still in the position that we could move to agreement. And this bill has that within it. It has the capability within it, even if passed, not to be implemented if we get to that stage. Now, there's one or two issues of, of detail I just want to address. Uh, one of them comes from Professor Tompkins, who asserted absolutely ex cathedra that Section 33 of the Continuity Bill, amending, amending Section 29 of the Scotland Act, is, and I'll quote him, manifestly out with competence. Well, no, it isn't. Section 1B of Schedule 4 of the Scotland Act 1998 expressly allows spent provisions to be amended once Brexit happens. The reference to EU law is spent. Secondly, Alison Harris talked about one bill. That's what she wanted to see. Well, that's what we've been seeking. That's what we've been negotiating about. That's what we've sought. That's what we want. One bill. But it is one bill, agreed, not imposed. And we'd be happy to have one bill if it was agreed, not imposed, to quote Professor Tompkins. Now to Jamie Green. It's almost impossible to keep up with the misrepresentations of the legislation, but let me just deal with two of them. The bill has been hastily drafted. The bill is closely based on the UK bill. That UK bill has had numerous improvements because of the scrutiny of the bill in this place. We have responded to the scrutiny of the UK bill and many of the provisions are identical. So if you would wish to criticise the drafting, start with the UK. And the second point about parliamentary consent. All the powers under the bill require parliamentary scrutiny in the normal way all require parliamentary approval. So those two points are simply wrong. They're not for interpretation, they're simply wrong. And in addition, in addition, you then have to look at the points that Graham Simpson and Dean Lockhart made. None of the existing powers will be affected. We want, you want, the SNP wants apparently all powers to be held in Brussels. Neither is true, neither is true. Mr. Simpson was a Brexiteer, and I know that the Brexit campaign was full of things that have turned out not to be true, but those two remain untrue. The list is clear. Many key powers will be affected. For example, pillars one and two of CAP. 
And if Mr Simpson does not know that there are changes in the administration of the common agricultural policy in Scotland, then he should know that. And similarly, we want all the powers to be held by Brussels. No, we don't. We want all the powers to be held by the Scottish people. That's what every chamber in the, the, everybody in this chamber should want. That is what we are here for. Popular sovereignty, not parliamentary sovereignty. No, I'm sorry, I'm not giving way. No, 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 no. I have very few minutes left. I have many few minutes left and a number of Tories still to contradict. Let me start. Let me go on to Liam Kerr's contribution. I'm sorry that he spent so much time in the Starbank Inn that his focus began to wobble a little because quite clearly he was not looking at the same bill as the one that's in front of me. In actual fact, the bill, as I've said, closely matches and in places exactly mirrors the withdrawal bill. So if he is a difficulty with draftsmen, if he is a difficulty with uh, defining things, then please refer it to them. But actually, some of the things, the two particular things he raised, are also untrue. The word perspective is accurate. Perspective means it has not happened yet. And Brexit has not happened yet. So I defend the word perspective. And the second one in terms of definitions, he didn't like the inability to define the word past. I refer him in, uh, into section 27.2. This actually defines it. It's in the section, just to be helpful, called interpretation. Which would, no, I'm sorry. It's no, you, you, no, I mean, I'm afraid, I'm clearly, I, I, clearly uh, he can go back and tell the regulars of the Starbank Inn about this, but as far as I'm concerned, he has got it completely wrong. There's a tendency, of course, to try and talk down any legislation from this government, because it's been done in Scotland, and to up, talk up legislation at Westminster. But if he's, got a problem, if he's got a problem with this bill, then he should raise it with the Westminster draftsman. Now, finally, final point. Fin final point. Of course, of course, what we actually now see is when we, get to the when we get to the detail of the fact, when we show that the assertions coming from the Tory benches are actually wrong, not interpretations, not, not just views, but actually wrong, we hear hollow laughter. That is hollow laughter. Because the reality is that we've spent a lot of time this afternoon here things about this bill from the Tory benches that simply aren't true. Now, there will be and are very strong attempts to make this bill better coming from the Labour Party, coming from the Greens, coming from the Liberal Democrats, and just occasionally coming from the Conservatives. I think that's probably accidental. But there are little bits here and there which are going to improve this bill. And at stages this evening, I will surprise one or two members their lucky evening will have come where I've said, you know, I think that's a good idea and I, I think the Scottish Government support this. But what we, what we will not support, what we will not support, what we will never support is a situation in which the interests of Scotland and the legislation in Scotland are subordinated to the interests of the Tory party and keeping a Tory government at Westminster. That will underwrite our laws, not now, not ever. Now, finally, let me, uh, let me comment on the contribution from Richard Lockhead, which I thought was very significant this afternoon. Richard Lockhead has enormous experience, particularly in the key areas under examination in this bill. He has, I think, been the longest serving cabinet secretary in a single post since devolution, alongside Mr. Swinney. I think the nine year period in, in office was highly significant, and I greatly enjoyed working with him, particularly as environment minister. And this analysis of reasons for the UK power grab was spot on except it was too generous. It missed out a single item. Because what he said was, first of all, that he found many people he'd worked with in Westminster to be hostile to devolution. And yes, they are. And secondly, he found many of them to be scared of any possible advantage that Scotland might have. And yes, they are. But also what has really shocked me over the last 18 months is the lack of knowledge of devolution. And the reality of the situation is they simply do not know how it works. Now, we will continue to endeavour to educate them on that matter. We will continue to work with them and we seek an agreement. But I go back to the very beginning of this, presiding officer. We will do so on the basis of agreed, not imposed. And if Mr Tompkins meant that in what he said earlier on, he will find people on these benches he can work with. If he didn't, there will be no agreement.
Thank you very much. That concludes our pre-stage two debate on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. And because we have moved members' business, uh, we are going we have moved members' business to accommodate, I should say, the Finance Committee, which will be meeting in this chamber at 5.45 to go through the Stage 2 amendments. That actually concludes today's business, and I close this meeting. <laughs>